Hello everybody, thank you for being here. Um, it is now 6.30 and I want to convene to open session. There was no action taken in closed session, so there's nothing to report. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? I have no, staff has no. Okay. Um, so, oral communications, that's now open for oral communications, and you may have five minutes to speak. So, who would like to speak? Debbie? <laughs> okay. I wasn't going to, but um, something occurred to me on coming in. Um, I don't know how to say this very diplomatically, but... The good news is we have a, a new board majority, and we have a new mission here, and we have a whole new plan and a whole new platform. And I'm very grateful for that. And I know that a lot of people are grateful for it because you guys got voted in by a very large margin. And I would just like to invite people who are perhaps from the last board, or supported the last board, or who supported the last platform, to come and join us because we have a lot of work ahead, and the focus is on infrastructure and money management. And I know a lot of things were going on in the past, but we're, we're going in a new direction here. And I think part of the problem that I'm seeing, and again, my personal opinion is, a lot of people have not been able to <coughs> confirm that the election is over. But it is over. It has been decided. The public has made their point. There's been a lot of platform issues that were thoroughly discussed, and this board is seeing those through. And I thank the board for having the courage to do that. And I believe you have the majority of the ratepayers behind you, as seen in the, the election. So please, there's never been a formal acceptance by the incumbents that they did not win the election. I think that would be a really healthy move if someone could formally congratulate the new board, and to commit yourselves to being part of the district and the district moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Virgil? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry, me again. Uh, Virgil Champlin, Brookdale. I was disappointed not seeing an agenda item discussing Director Bruce's participation in the recent social media madness. I'm unconvinced that she regrets her two posts, which clearly took advantage of this unfortunate incident attempting to redirect some of the popular outrage to unfairly uh, malign fellow directors. Her only statement was that she would not apologize for displaying outrage at Director Smallman's offensive behavior. But this display of great moral authority was in fact a rhetorical misdirection from the criticism level. Taking political advantage of an insulting situation minimizes the victim's distress and was as inappropriate as the original insult. Director Bruce was not the victim, and the other directors were not the abusers. Since I wanted a discussion and not a sermon, I'll abandon my criticism with an appeal to Director Bruce's better nature. And I believe she truly has one. Over the last several years, I've witnessed a few unfortunate outbursts, but have also seen very thoughtful policy comments and a regular willingness for actively listening to the public, an inclination often repressed by many of the prior directors. You have different colleagues now, Please explore that potential. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? Yes. Lou Ferris Felton. So this is what we have become. I was shocked and saddened by what transpired at the end of the special board meeting last Thursday. The meeting was called to address only one issue, the consideration for censure of a board member for what was truly reprehensible behavior. Still, some present lowered, them, some present lowered themselves to the same level of hate and disrespect displayed by the board member in question. In what was clearly an invasion of privacy, and quite possibly more, two members of the public referred to pictures on social media showing the board member in question at home at the time of the meeting. Why he was home doesn't matter. What does matter is they were taking pictures of this, if someone was taking pictures of this truck and peering into his window. It is particularly egregious for the person who was a prior member of the same board. Knowing what it's like to be a member under a microscope, this alone should have prevented this reckless behavior. Why, did, why have we become like this? 
It is not uncommon these days. It seems more important to win at all costs or get our way than to be right and do right. Before you ask, yes, I include myself in this category. That is why I've stepped back and asked some probing questions. We who live in this pristine valley have much to be thankful for. We are neighbors, friends, and by all accounts, in this together. If we are eager to fight the righteous fight, then there are plenty of foes outside of SLV trying to do us harm. Other areas of the county covet the plentiful water we possess and are proceeding in not so subtle ways to come after it. Lest we forget our friends in Sacramento, they too are making our life difficult. Nate Gillespie recently made me aware of proposed new state regulations that increase analyte testing by fourfold. No new testing, just repeat testing. As a scientist, I question the added statistical confidence we get from a fourfold increase in cost. I am going to try hard to be more considerate with others with whom I disagree, listen more intently to what they have to say, and to try to find common ground through compromise. Remember, too, that the board members are basically volunteers, worthy of our support. If we want to keep high-quality water at a reasonable price, get involved, make suggestions, be considerate, and exercise give and take. Remember, we are all either part of the problem or part of the solution. If we continue to act the way we have, we will suffer the fate John Milton describes in Paradise Lost. Uh, any other public comments? No? Okay, thank you. Um, the first item of business, we, we have no unfinished business, but we have Environmental Committee public member appointments. And there was also a budget and finance resignation, but there's nothing on here for a new budget and finance person. Um, so how many people here have applied to be on the environmental committee? Uh, could, sir, your name? John Sutton. Okay, John and? Elaine Fresco. Okay, thank you. All right. And I did receive um, messages from the other two um, applicants, and their, they, their notes are in front of you. Okay. Um, being on a committee is important, and this board has run on certain policies like cutting costs, uh, getting rid of glyphosate, certain things. And um, we hope we don't have to keep debating these in committee. If you think you want to continue to debate these items in committee, um, please say so. Okay, uh, John, if you would like to stand up and tell us why you want to be on this committee. I think you're a new sure. new in the valley. <laughs> right. Well, so I think that's probably actually a very reasonable place to start is um, I don't want to make this sound like inappropriate. I, most of you have never seen me before. I've lived here for about a year and just came upon the opportunity and I've been investigating all sorts of ways to, to contribute to the place that I now call home. So from a background standpoint, um, I've just really enjoyed water. It's kind of odd. I, in high school, I worked for a water purification company. I've owned my own uh, distillers, um, and I work in the energy sector, and there's a, obviously a nexus between the energy and water. So to me, it's just it's, it's an important part of uh, life and community, and so I'm just looking for a way to, to contribute. Thank Thanks. you. And... Oops. <clears throat> Elaine, you want to tell us why you want to be on the committee? Um, yeah, I, I lived uh, here in Felton for about eight years, and actually our property borders the uh, San Lorenzo Valley watershed. And I have just seen how important the environment is. I've always been um, interested in environmental issues. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a retired nurse midwife. 
I have a science background. Um, and we do all sorts of things in our property to stay environmentally responsible. We have we use gray water, we catch rain, we have a ten we have a now we have caught about ten thousand gallons this winter. Um, we um, have animals, we compost, we have a worm bin, we have a garden, we have an orchard, and we have native plants and we try and get rid of our non-native plants. We're pulling broom all the time. <laughs> and I just think it's a, I, I, I feel like I'm a protector of the environment and I want to be involved. Do uh, board members have any questions? Oh, well, I, I, I wasn't sure. Um, I, the, we, did, we did these committee appointments before, and I, I'm in favor of um, just allowing um, to allow all, all the public members uh, to, to join the uh, committee. But I, to me, the more the merrier. <laughs> and so anyway, that's, I, 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 I would like to um, put my thought into that, to, um, that I think that all the applicants be assigned to, to be appointed. Because um, that's what we did in the last, all uh, uh, the other appointments. Um, Instead of selecting, in the past we've, to clarify, we've only selected one, you know. So anyway, I, I would just like to make a comment of possibly just allowing to all the um, applicants to join, join the um, committee and have um, equal amount of voting power. Uh, did you, did any, well, that, that's, any, any of you over there want to, yeah. Bob, no? I just appreciate all of the applicants. It's nice that you put your hat in the ring. Um, I concur with Mr. Smallman that we have uh, four very capable uh, applicants and I think that they have diverse perspectives and each of them would serve the district's priorities well. Um, well, I have a little issue with having all four members because a quorum would be four members and it could create a problem that there are six people. Um, and we, we didn't pick everybody, all the people who applied before. We picked, I think at the most, three, three people. For a committee, um, so if I were to pick my top three, Madam Chair, it would be Mr. Sepp, Ms. Fresco, and Ms. Tina Toe, who introduced herself to us at uh, the not quite realized last environmental committee meeting. That she came and introduced herself, and she is, uh, I think, a very articulate and uh, well qualified applicant. Okay, anybody else? I kind of like uh, this fellow Kevin O'Connor. I don't know if we got any comments from him, but I really appreciated his background and his experience. Okay. And I, I'm not sure, but you might be right to have like a, 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 an odd number might be beneficial to not, you know, to avoid any tie votes or whatever. So, so well, there might be something I, to what you're saying there. So, but, uh, I'm, I'm going to suggest. Okay that we pick the two that are here tonight and hoping that they will work with us with our goals uh, because you do serve at the pleasure of the board and if you don't like our goals or where we're going then we've got a problem so if you think you can do that and if the board agrees on me picking the two of you that are here, um, I, that's my suggestion. Yes. Yeah, I think uh, you know one of the things that I'm really interested in personally is uh, starting to expand the number of people that get involved in the San Jose Valley Water District. Um, you know, demographics are. Um, Unstoppable, and we are going to, over the course of the next 10 to 15 years, face a 
um, situation where we're going to need uh, leaders for our community. And so for people to move in to our community and want to volunteer, as, as you do, Mr. Sepp, I think that is a fantastic thing. It's very difficult to choose among a lot of the people that apply. There's a lot of very strong uh, candidates with background. But um, I could I could go along with your uh, suggestion. Okay. Anybody? I would like to pick a third. Yeah, I, I, I did know what uh, more I think. I, um, I, well, I, originally I said all four, but I think it'd be really a big advantage to have a, an odd number, uh, just in case there was sort of one of those sort of split vote decisions. So I think, um, obviously, uh, to pick, I think we should. I, I mean, I agree with Director Bruce. I think we should pick a third. From the third. Uh, and I heard your your third pick. I have a little issue. I'm getting tired of being told. Um, that we are moved by um, our emotion, not by science, and I have a hard time going along with your pick. Do you have a different pick? No, I, I don't. Yes. I mean, for me, the, the key point is making sure that three is uh, is the quorum, right? At least three. Yeah. So that means you could have either you know three people, four people, or five people. It, 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 the quorum basically is the same for, for all of them. Um, I, I think the committee, just to, to be clear, the committee is um, an advice and recommendation uh, committee. And in most cases operates within some boundary of consensus or at least trying to get something that um, most people can agree with. If that situation doesn't occur, I have absolutely no issue with the fact that there might be a couple of different opinions that come in with no recommendation uh, for the board to consider or for the committee to ask the board for additional guidance on what to do. Uh, which I'd be very happy to do. So I don't, I don't see that five is necessarily an absolute requirement. Um, I, I think we can, I mean, we have four on another committee, I believe, or at least we did, I think on the budget committee until yeah, Ms. Amick uh, resigned from uh, another uh, committee. Um, so yeah, I'd be, I'd be fine with two. And, and I have no objection to, to your preference, Mr. Swan. I just happened to have met Ms. Toe and was impressed by how articulate and poised she was and how engaged she was in the issues. So I, I'm I, sure I, she's very articulate. I, I want to be able to, I don't want to hear again that we're not scientists. And we aren't. But we, we ran on a platform, we were voted for. So. That was my, that was where I was going with that. So I think both of the other applicants are both scientists. One has a master's of science, master's of environmental science, and the other has a degree I'm in not, I'm not. I'm not against science. Science is not perfect. Science doesn't agree with itself. There's all kinds of of um, uh, of thoughts when it comes to science, um, I do like um, I when I read Elaine Fresco's um, item, I liked all the things she said she was doing on her property. Um, although she did bring up the word science too. Sorry, it's a little uh, sensitive spot. I like. Um, I like um, John. He's new. He, I don't think his mind's made up. I think he'll come and listen. I hope Elaine will come and listen. Um, I, I wish that um, the other two were here. And usually if people don't come, uh, we don't always pick the people who you know, generally, we don't pick them if we can't talk to them. Uh, so, well, I, I, I mean, we... I'm not done. Okay. Uh, 
we can always, if we decide we want different and more, and let me, don't get me wrong, you can disagree with us. You can disagree with us. That's fine. But I don't want every committee meeting to become a battleground. And that's, can be, that can happen. So it's the same way with this board. I would like us to work together. I would like as committees that you will work with the whatever board members are on your committee. That's that's all I really ask. You're entitled to your opinion. I would like to make a motion that we appoint Mr. John Sepp, Ms. Elaine Fresco, and Mr. Kevin O'Connor. Is there a second? I'll second it. You want to call the boat? Oh, oh, so we need to, uh, no, we need to go to the community for... Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Pardon me. I tend to get a little ahead of myself. <laughs> um, comments from the public? Yes, Nancy. I'm Nancy Macy from Boulder Creek, and I'm um, delighted to be able to be here tonight because I didn't think I was going to be able to because I think this is really cool to watch how this is going. Um, I I'm grateful that you are actually bringing someone who is not here today. There was a woman who introduced herself at a regular meeting here who said she had applied. Um, I thought it was really cool. She came out of her way to introduce herself, and so she's not here tonight because she couldn't be. Um, and she knew she couldn't, so she came. So I thought that was cool. And, and you got their statement, which you know, I know it's really nice to be able to interchange and have questions, but I, I don't think you should just close your mind to the fact that if the person's not here, that you're going to choose the person who is, and especially if someone like that has gone out of their way. So, thank you for being open to that. That's all. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Chuck? Um, I was very pleased to see four very well-qualified candidates apply mm -hmm. um, to this. Um, there tends to be people who can't remain on it. You know, when you, you put four people on the committee, people sometimes find they have conflicts and can't make them. You won't have four on the committee forever. So, um, in the interest of engaging everybody in the community who wants to participate in this, I encourage you to do all four. But I think the three that have been, the motion has been made for three well-qualified candidates and it's been seconded. So I look forward to, if that's how the vote goes, that there will be three instead of four really well-qualified candidates on this committee. Any other comments? Debbie? Yeah, just a short comment, sort of following up on some of the conversation here. I, I really like the two that have shown up and um, fully support both of them for being on this committee. The importance of being supportive of the board is not more apparent than on my own committee that I'm serving on, where I have, there's five members and two of them have loyalties to the past board, more so than the new board. And it has created a lot of more time going over items that have already been discussed. And so it is kind of important that whoever gets on any committee, whether it's environmental or budget or admin, does embrace the forward motion of this board and the goals. And certainly other opinions are welcome, but not to the extent that it harms the ability of the committee to move function and move forward. It's just my observation. So I, I encourage people to try to do the best they can in meeting the goals of the board. And yes, Chris? Chris Finney, Boulder Creek. Um, it disturbs me to hear people talking about loyalties to uh, various board members or boards to talk about supporting um, goals of particular directors. Um, as a customer and a ratepayer of this district, I would hope that any directors, any volunteers, any board member, or any committee members would be um, most dedicated to the best interests of the district. And um, the goals of the district. 
and the best interest of the ratepayers. Um, and so I also was impressed with the people who applied. I also am encouraged that so many people volunteered. Um, but it worries me to hear things that sound to me like uh, loyalty oaths being asked for. Um, that's not something that I, that, that just disturbs me. It, it, it is not something that I want to hear in the United States of America, frankly. <clears throat> Any other comments? Well, uh, Chris, we ran on a certain platform. We won a huge um, uh, amount. Um, and we know that we represent the whole district, everybody in the district. But bottom line, we made, um, let's say, promises <coughs> to people who voted for us. And I feel, all I'm trying to say is, we feel obliged to meet those promises. We don't want to hurt other people by doing that, but everybody had a chance to vote, and it was a huge turnout, and it's not like we squeaked by. So I, I feel that we have a right to ask for people to work with us. They can express their opinion, but that they work with us, and we've got important work to do. The environment is important, and we need to take care of it. So could you please call the question? Uh, yes. Director Swan? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. Um, just to clarify that, so that we're voting on the three, oh. um, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, um, well, just to, it's John, Sa, um, Elaine, Fresco, and Kevin O'Connor. Kevin O'Connor. Okay. Yes. yes. President Henry? Yes. Director Bruce? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, let's move on here. Um, so the next item on the agenda is uh, board member committee assignments. Uh, possible discussion and action by the board regarding uh, current member committee assignments. Two of the committees that we would like to look at uh, for possible change is the Environmental Committee and the Engineering Committee. Um, as board president, I can suggest who suggest board members for those committees, but it's up to the board to agree to whatever I suggest. If they don't like it, they can tell me so. Right? Okay. So for the Environmental Committee, um, I, I would like Margaret Bruce and uh, uh, Bob, if he, if he's available, are you available? Well, I'm, I'm available, but I think we need to talk about what the underlying. Okay, the underlying issue. Here is, okay, the underlying issue is we want to make chains for the committee assignments. Um, 
Most of the committee's meetings are held during the day. Um, and that's because of staff demands. It costs more money when we have meetings at night. Um, Director Smallman has made it clear that he can't and won't attend daytime meetings. Um, he has just not gone to meetings. Um, uh, in 2018, in the summer, he had a fake meeting notice that looked like it was a district's. Serving on committees requires board members to work with the public and other board members. So, because of past behavior, we are suggesting taking <clears throat> Director Smallman off of committees. Now, he has agreed to take training, uh, and I hope he does that. And I hope he uh, rehabilitates himself and that later he can be back on committees. That's my hope. And that's why we're doing this. So, Bob? Yeah, I'm, I, okay. Um, I think that's a good background on it. On the, I think there's two issues here. One is Bill's ability to attend meetings during the day. The other is the um, comments that Bill made recently in which we had a meeting for last week um, about censure. Um, Bill, relative to your ability to make meeting times, what is the times that you can do? Uh, well, I, I've, I've prepared a, a statement tonight in so, my defense. Um, yeah. um, I will yield yeah. to Bill. <laughs> How uh, long is the statement? <laughs> as long as I need. <laughs> so, uh, I want. Uh, I really want to make it patently clear. Uh, to the public that my statement on the uh, next door post was directed towards a, a certain group of people. But I do understand that people on the outside of that conversation, and I understand how upset that they were from that um, uh, statement. And I, that's what I hope that I learned um, going to the um, diversity training uh, class, which I understand that it's already been um, scheduled. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm gonna go, I was actually going to contact them, and um, but I'm also going to double down and also attend the non-violent uh, communication Santa Cruz, which I've gone to before. Um, I have to say that I've descended down. I, you know, I grew up, you know, I don't know, I, you know, I'm a product of the 50s and he's in the schoolyard where boys would fight together and we'd call each other every other name under the sun. Um, I got really upset about um, this post about advertising glyphosate for sale. I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a true environmentalist. Rachel Carson's my hero and um, my desire is to put Monsanto and Dow Chemical out of business. Um, that, that, that I, but it's no place for a director to have that. I know that I have, I've been, I have a problem. I get mad. I get, I get on next door. Actually, when I get on those next door posts, I, I want to debate. I don't think there's been a director for this district that's been more open about my position to the public about how exactly what I've done for this district. Um, what are my accomplishments? Is to stop paying for the defense of Ter Terra Viera. I think I believe I have an over overwhelming um, approval rating from this district on moving forward on interesting top topics. And my, you know, I've told myself many, many, many times before, and I've gotten in trouble with this before, is that I, I just come here, I provide my input, 
and um, and you can take it or leave it. But I think we, what we have here is really an ego problem. A lot of people have serious ego problems, and it's either my way, and you can't get engaged in um, reasonable debates that way. And that on next door, um, every every time I've gotten on next door, it's been arguing back and forth, and people have called me every name under the sun. I slip up one time, and then now my all my enemies, which is about probably less than 10% of this district, are picking that up as a knife to attack me and say, oh, you know, but th this is, has nothing to do with what I am going to, my, how, what I am going to contribute to this district. Words are words, and I like I've, I apologize, I'm going to apologize over and over again that, uh, you know, I'm, uh, they were wrong, I, you know, and the only thing I can do is go to diversity training and stop this, and I can also stop going on to next door because I, the, these are just meaningless debates, etc. And they're hurtful. I have no concept of what it's like to be a woman, to be honest with you. I have no concept of what it's to be like to be LGBTQ. And I can understand now, but somebody told me, said, hey, that can really hurt you for a thing. But I, you know, I, and the other thing is I've gotten these three elected. I did that as well. And I've also got glyphosate banned. Okay? There's nobody, you've, uh, there's nobody can argue about that. And so I was, you know, I w this, my comments were against people that use glyphosate. That not the, not the, um, I, I couldn't understand why the opposition were against it actually because they, they're against it basically because they thought that the <coughs> environment is so sensitive that they couldn't, we couldn't pull the scotch broom. Um, without um, using, it was a last resort in other words. But I'm coming from the guys that I know, and I, I just for example, I was in El Dorado Hills the other day, and I was walking by, and there's a very nice neighborhood in El Dorado Hills, and there's here's this guy spraying bike Roundup on the crack, on the, he had rolled, nice rolled curb and gutter and paved streets. Thousands of houses. And all the water comes down off these hills. I remember back in the day there was nothing up there. But all that water goes, flows right into Folsom Lake. And he's spraying glyphosate on the, on the, on the weed sprint. And I go, hey, all you got to really do is take a hog burner and torch all those weeds and seal it with a crack sealer instead of going flying around them. Okay, but these guys, they don't, they don't know. They don't know that. Um, this up, please? They don't know that. Um, they don't respect environmentalists. In other words, they're guys like me, but they're not educated in science, which you are probably. And then, but um, but they are not educated in science, so they don't respect environmentalists. But they take the hard line because Rachel Carson got DDT off the shelves, and we can put Monsanto and Dow Chemical out of business. And so, anyway, my slip-up was, my post was towards those guys. It wasn't, I didn't mean to, um, to insult, you know, because I understand people from the outside saw it as harmful towards, uh, um, you know, attacking the LP2 community. So again, you know, it's ridiculous. I've been, I've been, I stuck my neck out to stop the spending of, of Viera, and then, um, and then I got censored for that. And so my other uh, contributions on the engineering committee, these three wanted to cut the education grants, which is only about uh, like thirty-five thousand dollars. We want to install a, um, a our in-house construction department, an engineering department. They could save the ratepayers millions and millions of dollars, and the reason why is because we just saw a um, bid for $468,000 to replace the PRVs, and, um, and my analysis was that we could actually do that project in-house for $300,000 um, a year. I mean, for that pro particular project, and if you add that up to about you know all the 
all the other projects that we're doing. Please wrap it up. Please. So, um, they, um, so we're, anyway, we're talking of savings of millions and millions of dollars. So it's completely ridiculous to take me off the engineering committee. You know, it's a committee that all it does is make recommendations. I'm a 30-year experienced uh, project manager, estimator, design, build, engineer that can add a valuable input to these decisions that are made to move this district forward to save millions and millions of dollars. So, and then you're, sub you're buying into this entire argument that I make this one mistake of talking about making fun on the internet, and you're going to get real upset at me that all I can say is I am really, really sorry that I'm, I'm I, you know, I'm, okay. anyway, what I'd like to offer anybody that, let me wrap this up, <laughs> again, I'm sorry, I mean, I really, really am sorry, you know, I mean, um, that I will pull Scotch Broom at anybody's house. Just email me, I'll come over, and I'll clear out your lot for that. And, you know, I mean, I, you know, there's over-the-top contributions of things that I, I'll, I can provide to the, this district. And, well, you know, the, and the censorship is completely worthless. And the, to take me off these, you know, committee meetings is, you know, I can see not seeing a lot of um, happy faces towards me, but, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm just, I swear to God, I'm just here to help, and, um, you know, I, you know, and well, back again to the, uh, the, the cure, um, well, the bottom line is I'm not homophobic. I'm not. I, I mean, I'm not. But I'm going to obviously go to this diversity training, and I think this is a good thing. I think this is a good thing for the entire board, actually. You know, that it's a bad, you know, usually when something bad happens, it's a good thing for the everybody. And then I'm going to double down and go back to the non-pilot uh, communication. So, anyway, I'm sorry. Okay. Um. Okay, so a handout in the audience. Yes. I'm a little disturbed. Um, when I came in, you were talking about goals of the district is to save, preserve the budget, and to not rehearse the past. And we just heard the past rehearsed again. I'm concerned that it's it's time to go forward, not back. Okay. Uh, yes, back there. Uh, James Kendall. I spoke last week from uh, Ben Lomond, and I was one of the original responders on the thread to you, Mr. Bill Smallman, and I would like to clear up what seems to be a few misunderstandings on your part. The blowback against you was not because of politics, not because of Roundup, not because of anything else, but because you decided the best way to insult somebody was to say that they were me. And I get that shit enough in my life and life is too long, I don't want to deal with another 45 years of having to deal with people like you using me as the ultimate insult. The fact that you chose to double down on it and the fact that you choose to roll your eyes at me now. No, I'm not. Can I respond? It's the, no. Okay. No. You, you are not rolling respond. your eyes. Is visible. Your online history, which is right there on the side menu on the Santa Cruz Sentinel comments, you have a very lengthy history of making very odd comments about a large numbers of groups of people. It's not just the queer community. It's not just people from Africa. It's not just the homeless. It's a nesting Russian doll of odd assumptions about the way the world works and people in it that I don't want to call bigotries because you shut down at that, but you have a very disturbing way of looking at the world and until you get the training and can recognize what's going on, step back from this. I voted for you. I agree with you about Roundup. 
I don't agree with you about all of this and making it into one long campaign speech about all the things that you've done and ignoring the core concept, which was you insulted a large portion of the valley, the queers, the rednecks, the rednecks who identify as queer, and the ones who support all of the above. Refuse to recognize it, double down, and continue to throw out more and more bizarre stereotypes until you reach the point where Roundup makes people trans and run off with the farmhands. <laughs> which is what you wrote, recognize that this is not some sort of political attack from your enemies. This is people who voted for you seeing what you write and going, holy shit, what is wrong? Thank you. Anybody else in the audience want to comment? No? OK. Um, moving on. Um, so, Director Fultz, can you be on the Environmental Committee? Well, I, I could serve on it. I think the bigger question is, what is what will be served here? Is this a punishment for Bill? Is that effectively, is that effectively what we're doing? It's a wake-up call. An intervention in some ways. Right. In my mind, it's a wake-up call, and he, uh, and I think he needs to realize he didn't get the three of us elected. He needs to realize that he did something he shouldn't have done. Um, I, I don't. He think okay. We censured him. In his own words, it means nothing. So what will mean something to Director Smallman? It doesn't seem anything will mean anything to him. And I would call this an intervention and hope that he takes his training, he, it sinks in, and he's rehabilitated, and he can come back and be on committees. But I, I'm not willing for him to be on committees tonight. That's my own personal feeling. You get your vote. Bill gets his vote. Steve. Uh, what's her name? What's her name? <laughs> <laughs> she gets her vote. <laughs> I know your We're name. You, you just had it. Give me a second. <laughs> I am getting old, you know, sometimes words come a little slow, but, yeah. um, so it's not up to me. It's not up to me. I'm simply asking if you could take that position or not take that position. I could. <clears throat> Bill, would you be willing to voluntarily step back from committees for a period of time? I, 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 have, I have two years left on my term, and I want to provide the best service to the public. So, um, you know, I, 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 you know, I know that I, yeah, I want, I'm going to go to that one, the, the diversity training. And then, but I also going to go to about three or four of the non-violent um, communication Santa Cruz events, um, and do that. Um, you know, the bottom line. I know. I somebody told me it's not enough to say that I'm. You know, I'm not homophobic, um, but to prove that. Again, my comment was. You know, I was, uh, you know, I, I'm just addicted to getting into this, I get into the next door uh, comments, and it was, I was a schoolyard, I was back in fifth grade with a group of boys in the playground, um, and it was not okay. something. Uh, would you please answer but, the but question? Maybe, but okay, maybe, maybe but anyway, to answer your question, um,
You know, I mean, what? Well, let me help you. Maybe, yeah. one, maybe one of the ways to demonstrate yeah. to the people that may be a little skeptical about your good intentions, what you intend to do, is maybe step back from it for like three or four months. That. Right. And I then, think. And I think. Can, and then we can have. Uh, you'll go through the training. Yes. And then at that time we can revisit it. Would, I, that, would that be acceptable? I think. I think. That, I, that I would like months. six yeah. months. Six months. Six months. Yeah, I, I, I would like to see real change. So, you know. Look, I, I, I'd like to do four. If you would voluntarily step aside. I would voluntarily months. for four. Okay, well, let's revisit again. Yeah. Well, what about the rest of the board? Well, personally, I think that this is totally appropriate response from the board for bills and actions. And you, you haven't helped the board at all. You know, we're under we're under a lot of, of uh, scrutiny as a new board, and and your behavior is drawing all the wrong kinds of attention to this board, and bringing that type of criticism on all of us. And it's not helping the community. It's not helping the board. It's not helping the water district. It's it's a mess, Bill. And and I don't, I don't think six months is too long either. Frankly, Bob, I think six months is fine. I would go along with that. I think you need the training, you need the, ex the exposure, and and uh, uh, and stay off the freaking social media. But yeah, I, I, I think the, the action is totally appropriate. I'd be supportive of six months as well, and let me chime in on the, it's really difficult to have committee meetings when one of the committee members is so inflexible about when they can meet. You don't run for office and then say, oh, it's an inconvenience. You run for office and you're signed up for the whole ride. And if you can't do the whole ride, you got to step back. So, you know, Bill, we did, I put it out to you. When would you like to meet? What day would you like to meet? Where would you like to meet? And didn't get anything back. I have, a, at least so far, a fairly flexible schedule. And I didn't get back Sure, this will work. So, six months. All right, so voluntarily step back for six months. We'll do okay. uh, reassignments of committees and then okay. we'll take a look at it. Okay, six now we'll do. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so, in that event, yes, I can do it. Okay. Um, so, is that agreeable to the board? And it's Margaret and, and yes. Bob. Yeah. Unless you guys want to do thumb more for it. Well, well there's one more to go. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm looking yeah. at him. I'll, I'll accept the engineering. Oh, you'd like to do the engineering, I Wendy? Love, I'd love to, Lois. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that means Margaret is on engineering and, and Steve. And when, I mean, when, when could you meet? Uh, please explain. I know you work. Yeah, I, I would only I would say that again, as I suggested in the past, that Margaret and I can sit down and discuss a, and come to an agreeable time. Mm -hmm. Typically, it's going to be on the same days that the board meets, and it would be in anywhere from early to mid afternoon. Mm -hmm. Either 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 set, either the first Thursday or the third Thursday of any yep. other month. Yep. And we can pick a specific time and stuff. Or, at, at our convenience. And if you want to back it up to the closed session, that works for me too. If that works for staff, sure. you know. Yeah. Well, we'll yeah we'll let the staff chime in. Yep. Agreeable to everybody, right? <laughs> yes. So they have okay. Answers. There are public members that have to be consulted. Yeah. But okay. okay. So we got some consensus here with the board. How about the public? What do you want to say that you haven't already said? Okay, so should, do we should we have to vote on this? Yeah. yeah, vote on this. I would, I would make a motion to accept the proposed changes to temporary changes to the board committee assignments, um, removing Mr. Smallman from his committee assignments for the period of six months and and instating uh, Mr. Fultz to the environmental committee board committee member and Mr. Swan and the board committee member for engineering, Director environmental, Bruce. and. Director Bruce, can I make a suggestion on the motion? Um, 
the suggestion would be to, to simply um, remove Director Smallman uh, for the time being and replace him with the new committee assignments as stated um, to be revisited after six months. But that way you don't end up with a vacancy, you know, if nothing happens right at six months. Okay. So to restate the motion, um, what you said. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be Holly. <laughs> It's all, all recorded. recorded and video, so I will figure but, that out. But is, it, is it clear for everybody in the audience what, what's yes. happening? Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, so you need to call the so vote we'll for second. whatever we'll was I'll, said. I'll do, a, I'll do a second on whatever. whatever. Yeah, okay. okay. Right. So whatever was said, right? <laughs> is that too vague? What the motion corrected by the attorney? It's on the recording, so I, yeah, I think we're not, okay. We're okay. Not, okay, all right, because I can't say it again. <laughs> Director Swan. Yes. Director Fultz. Yes. Director Smallman. Yes. I'm sorry? Yes, yes. he yes. said yes. Uh, President Henry. Yes. Director Bruce. Yes. 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 Okay. All righty. Well... Um, so, uh, item C, and do I turn that over to James? Okay, James, do you want to present that item? So, this is a proposal to get go into contract with Martin B. Feeney, consulting hydrologist, with a proposal totaling in $38,100 for the rehabilitation of the District Quail Well 5A and Olympia Well 3. And this is to rehabilitate these two wells with jetting and cleaning of the screens from Iron and Magnes buildup. And we want to sole source Mr. Martin B. Feeney as he has been our hydrologist on these wells for years and his knowledge is impeccable. With our wells, he knows every one of our wells from top to bottom, and that is our recommendation. Um, I do have one correction to the, um, there was a district rules and regulation article 14, contracts and purchasing section 14.09 states whenever professional specialized consultants or sole source services or supplies are purchased. The board may dispense with the provisions of this article. And in the actual memo, it was stated as um, ordinance, eight. Eight. ordinance, eight. Eight. ordinance eight. Yeah, which is actual article 14. It was changed. Okay. All right. Any questions? Oh. Ms. Uh, Director Fultz. Whichever. <laughs> um, it wasn't clear to me, does this actually do the execution of the work as well? Or is this just the planning for the work and the overseeing of the work and that there would be other costs potentially involved in the execution? The planning's been done. Okay. Um, we've already done that. We had him write a report. The report's attached in here. Okay. Um, this is for overseeing the work and overseeing the work only. And there will actually be another contractor that will have to be awarded as well, which that part will go out to bid for the rehabilitation contractor of the wells. That part will go out to bid if this is sole source to Mr. Martin B. Is this an emergency? We have been working on this, and our production in those wells has deteriorated significantly due to plugging, and it's been inspected. And he already wrote a report on these wells, put everything together, and this is the... Well, so one of the things that I'd like to do is make sure that I understand the total scope of work that we're talking about here and not sort of piecemeal it in. Um, so there is a contractor that's going to have to be hired in addition. It's going to cost some additional amount of money. We don't exactly know what it is yet. Correct. Right. Yeah. Mark, Martin Feeney will write the bid spec for each individual well, okay. and then we'll go out for formal bidding. And 
Have we, we done this before? Yes. Yeah. Clean? yes. What did it cost when we did it before? We just did past tempo well seven seven and it was almost says one hundred and seven thousand, something like that, yeah. For the cleaning. For the actual cleaning, yeah. It's it, that's not including Mr. Feeney's contract. Right. right. Feeney's a separate and he was nineteen thousand in that. Okay. Yeah. So about it. 18,000, 19,000 per well is sort of what it is. That would be a competitive bid. And we had, I think we had three or four bidders last time when we did the past example well and select. Um, it's per se, it's not, a, the well hasn't failed, it's not an emergency in that sense. Um, but Martin Feeney has, as James said, is, has a, a great understanding of our well field. Uh, some of the lo local hydrologists have used them long time he's got great how long, how long have we used it? Probably about uh, a good twenty years on and off. And we used him and, and other geologists or hydrologists like uh, um, you know, Nick Nicholas Johnson and but for different types of of work. Martin's more of the mechanical end and gets into the well construction um, and the maintenance of wells. And there's there's no one else that can do this. There's other people but they'll be from farther out of the area. And we won't have a, a historical um, knowledge of uh, working with. Um, you know, he does a lot of the local wells. He does Scotts Valley. He's got done doing pretty much the same Scotts Valley's wells, and he does work in a lot of the, this local area. I've had. Yeah, there are other hydrologists, but they'll come from out of the area, yeah. and they'll probably be. I won't know without a bid, but they would be more expensive. Well, that's yeah. one of the reasons. You that's correct. Yeah. I mean, if it was an emergency and we needed to do this right away, then I would expect both the consulting engineer and the work to be done sort of simultaneously. But if we're going to go out to bid on this, um, it doesn't sound like it's an emergency. Enough. What's the target for getting this work completed before the, 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 the summer months, before? Um, in July, August, take one well down at a time, mm -hmm. well be offline. This year we're not anticipating you know, drought conditions to where we should be able to take a well offline. Um, and the reason we do it this way is because Martin will write these specs out for the well drillers to bid on. He'll put all the, the, the technical language together on how the process is going to go for each individual well. Um, the depth of each well, the screen intervals, all the, all the technical data, he'll put that big package together, the technical end, we'll use our front end insurance docs, and then we'll go off the bid. And then he'll come back after we select and oversee and be on site for the complete treatment process. And I, I've had some experience with this being on a Lompico water board that when that happens to your well, you've got to clean it out. It really needs to be done. Um, and it, it involves people who really know what they're doing. We can't just dive down in the well and clean it out. <laughs> and then it's got to be disinfected and all that. Yes, Bill? Uh, yeah, I, I agree with Lois and from my experience, I think this reasonable cost. I think in the future um, and committee meetings with budget and finance to talk about certain um, when, you know, in my opinion this is not a worth, bid worthy project it's just, to me seems worthy but I think in, in future committee meetings hopefully when I'm back on the engineering committee to discuss um, the best cost effective way and to me, you know, um, I'd, I'd like to make a motion to approve the cost of $38,100 to, uh, uh, to do this work. I have but a question. For person, Before we vote on it, are there, are there any special permitting or, or aspects associated with his work that have to be done? And could that draw the, uh, affect the timeline of when you want to have this accomplished? I don't believe there is any for me. No impacts? Uh, uh, well, I'm just thinking because like there's no, um, we're all on pavement, so we're not worried about um, sand park plant or a June beetle or endangered species. This will be done on, on pavement or on existing access roads. Um, I don't believe so. So it's just hiring him and then he creates the spec and then we get Then we go out to bid and we pick one and we move. 
as, as time goes on, I, mean, I don't want to speak for James, but I think you will see, in, over the next few years, you will see a maintenance schedule for these wells that will be done by what, every three years? Is that yes. to to uh, combat the iron bacteria. Um, so we hope to get this on a more routine basis where, um, I don't know if it would change the bidding with Mr. Phoenix, I'd hate to lose Martin to a firm out of the area, you know, increase staff time um, and increase his time while I'm trying you know, to learn um, the district and, the, and the other low drillers. But we are going to look at getting this more of a, a budgeted routine maintenance as time goes on. I think that's essential. I mean, no, I, mean, I agree, and I kind of think that's where you're coming from. Well, yeah, I mean, one of the things that I think the, the district has, has needs to do better than in the past is that things, things seem to come in pieces. Well, it's more of a, a surprise as opposed to scheduled and, and understood. And even with this one here, there's another $100,000 that's going to come in behind right. it. Um, to me, the communication to the board needs to be uh, holistic, not piecemeal. Yeah. As and, we go forward. And in the past, the money wasn't there to do scheduled maintenance. It was at budget time what was needed to be done, and we tried to get in as much as possible because the funds weren't there to do the scheduled maintenance. Hopefully, with you know, current rates and the way we're um, looking at our maintenance, we will at least propose to the board so the board knows if there's something going to get cut and not get done. But a lot of, there's, and you're going to see over your term a lot of, you know, why wasn't this done? Because your same questions are going to come up a lot, especially on tank coatings. There's one that gets, gets put off every year that should have been done. We should be scheduling every few years to do a different tank. You're going to see a lot of money coming in on maintenance of tank coatings. Very similar to the same thing, what's going on with uh, the well rehab. But those can be good, um, tank coatings and tank but there's a lot of deferred maintenance out of the distribution system that you're going to see. And if we're starting to get funds and be able to do it, and that will be coming to all of you at budget time. And so hopefully a lot of this will not come up. But it's going to be a while before we get on a, a decent maintenance table. Okay. Uh, whatever your name is, do you have a comment? <laughs> <laughs> I, I support this proposal to use Martin Feeney. You trust him. Staff's worked with him. He knows our wells. He knows our system. Right. Been here uh, since the early 1990s. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. Okay. I'm going to offer one additional comment, if I may, on that. I understand that there's a lot of people that have worked for us for a very long time and we're comfortable with them. Um, but I've had circumstances where that comfort level can lead to um, unintended consequences. In addition, um, we need to expand our bench. Mm -hmm. If we're relying on the same contractors over and over again, and the same consultants over and over again, and we've been doing so for 25 to 30 years, again, demographics being what they are, eventually, we need to have people that are, are can step in, in behind them at a certain period of time. That's just good business for the district. That's nothing personal. Has nothing to do whether or not they're competent or do a good job or we know them or anything like that. It's the district has to be prepared for folks like this retiring at some point or deciding they don't want to work as hard anymore. It's definitely coming down the tunnel. And, uh, and it's coming. I, I, I would say a lot of people. But this is also, so, which is another area of your concern, we're going to be reaching much further out from Santa Cruz County or locally. I, 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 I know that. that's one of your other concerns that you want to see is. <laughs> work on more local, which there isn't a lot of, I, and the more we reach out, the further these people are going to come. We, uh, but I don't know that. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. No evidence I, of that. I, 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 I recognize the, the silver tsunami and the relentless drip of the sand through the hourglass. We have a lot of talented folks who've supported this district <laughs> various contracting capacities for a long time, and I want to emphasize the long time part, and it makes us vulnerable. Yeah, I, I personally know contractors that are you know, my age, that it would help to know that, oh, they're going to end up, like you said, not might be available. To, so to have a backup, mm -hmm. All right. yeah, to research and find out available. No problem. Anyway. Okay. All right. 
so, uh, yes. Um, I may have misread the paperwork, but didn't it show $7,000 for travel and per diem? Is, did I misread that? Because you said he was local. Well, he, he doesn't live, so to speak, local in the San Lorenzo Valley. He's coming, I think, what, from Salinas? I think. And then he has, he has uh, other people that will fill in when he's not there for a continuous operation. So he's not coming, he's not flying in, but he's local, about as local as you can find a hydrologist. I think he's on a service. He also has people that work for him yeah, that do work that from work down there. south. They come up from down yeah. south. His incumbent, in incumbents. They come from down south. He has people from all over the state that come in. And help him out. I think his address yeah. is Ventura at the bottom of his yeah. Also, he oversees. He oversees the project, right? Yes, him and his incumbents. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take a while for it to be done. So we have a motion. Did we get a second on it? I don't know that we did. I made the motion. I don't think we didn't get a motion. No, we did get a motion. We got a motion. I don't believe we heard a second. Well, we had, we weren't done talking. I'll make a motion of accepting, I'll make it again, I'll make a motion of accept the cost of $38,100 to contract with the Guy. Sure. 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 clarification, there's a resolution, um, a proposed okay. resolution yeah. number 31, Yeah. Make a motion to accept the resolution. Second? Well, I'll second. Uh, okay. Does anybody in from the audience want to say something before we vote here? No? Okay. There's a motion and a second. And a second. And um, so, Polly, I'm ready. Do your job. <laughs> Director Swan. Yes. Director Falls. Yes. Director Smallman. Aye. President Henry. Yes. Director Bruce. Yes. Okay. So, next item our esteemed attorney there, um, and it is on um, social media and browning. So I'll give you the floor. Thank you, Chair Henry, and I believe uh, we were able to turn it up on the screen. Oh, the loud, technology so did not overcome us. Well, sometimes it gets loud, so I didn't want to do it while you guys were all in the middle of Archaic email saved the day. Send an email to one that works. I, I believe the Fountain Library will have a much, much more advanced <laughs> system. Just saying. Just saying. Well, <laughs> uh, the logistics all work out. Beautiful location. We'll make them work. Did you think that's about? My house is up there. <laughs> Is it, are we going to be looking at this? So I don't have to twist my head. Right. Yeah, the, the paper, if you got one, is exactly what's going to be on the screen. It's not, it is exactly? It is exactly what's going to be on the screen. Did you take my phone again? no signal. What? You took my phone again. I didn't hey, take We have been overcome by technology. It's not no, he's out. It's got a fault line in it. Takes a minute for it to get back up. Quit putting it on. It's pardon us. Uh, do people need a short break? You want to do jumping jacks or anything? Okay, that was a break. You may go. All right. Okay, so it's going to take a minute. It looks like for the, uh, the presentation to come up, um, but I can get started uh, just off my notes here. Um, to be clear, this presentation is a response to some of the controversy that has percolated up over the last couple of weeks about uh, social media posting and the Brown Act. 
Um, this is not a full-blown Brown Act training. I don't expect it to take more than about 15 minutes or so. You've had separate Brown Act trainings. Um, so I'm going to try to get right to the point. Um, the presentation, if you haven't had it in front of you, quote some of the key language from the Brown Act. I'm not going to read that to you. Uh, because we've already been through that, but I am going to kind of summarize the main takeaways um, that are important in the context of social media. So something that's important to understand about the Brown Act is that in the interest of promoting open meetings and public participation in um, matters of public concern that are before the agency, it, is, it essentially prohibits non-public meetings. It requires that the agency conduct its meetings in a public forum such as this instead of in private settings or, or in back rooms. Um, so that kind of begs the question, what is a meeting? Um, under the Brown Act, almost anything can be a meeting. Any kind of communication among a majority, uh, a quorum majority of the board can be a meeting as that term is understood under the Brown Act. So what the Brown Act says is that such meetings have to be open. <coughs> That means there has to be a, an agenda, it has to be properly noticed, an agenda posted within the required time frame. The public has to be allowed to come in and comment on the business before the district um, and to hear the deliberations of the board. Only matters on the agenda can be discussed during the meeting, not things that were not put on the agenda. Um, and that creates a setting where all the actions and deliberations uh, take place in the meeting room and not outside the meeting room. Okay. Can you go, do you have control? Mm -hmm. Stephanie, can you go to the next slide? All right. There we go. So what the Brown Act prohibits then in order to make sure that meetings are open to the public is prohibits a majority of the legislative body from consulting with each other outside of a properly noticed meeting regarding matters within its jurisdiction, and notice how broad that is. That doesn't just mean matters that have been put on an agenda. That means anything that is within the jurisdiction of the agency to consider. So if a majority of the legislative body is going to talk about district business or things that could be district business, it has to be done with a proper meeting agenda and in the meeting room. Next slide. I, I called this slide very purposefully um, other communications instead of non-restricted communications because I'm a lawyer and I split hairs. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm calling this other communications because these things are not prohibited by the Brown Act. That doesn't mean they're always okay. <laughs> there are other rules that can apply. But these other communications are things that are not limited by the Brown Act. That includes communications not within the jurisdiction of the legislative body. So, you know, board members can talk about purely social matters or you know, fire department business or other things um, outside of the meeting room. That's perfectly okay. Uh, the Brown Act also does not prohibit individual contacts or conversations between board members and staff um, or even between board members as long as it doesn't involve a majority or a quorum of the board. Of course, that's tricky, because if two board members talk to each other, there's always a risk that a third board member could be you know, looped into the conversation. There also can be a perception, if a couple board members are talking to each other, that a third board member might get involved, and then you have a quorum. But it is not a Brown Act violation if less than a quorum talks to each other about matters within the, the district's uh, jurisdiction. Question. Yes. Could you give an example of where that would be a problem, what you just talked about, and mm -hmm. where you've seen a problem of that in the past? Okay, well, I think this sort of dovetails with the next slide, which is about serial meetings. So this is where, you know, communication, individual contacts become a problem under the Brown Act, is where you have serial meetings. This means, you know, it may be that two, two board members are just talking to each other, a board member is talking to a staff member, um, that's fine, but it can, can become a meeting in violation of the Brown Act if other people get looped into the conversation. The traditional ways of thinking about this are hub and spoke and daisy chain. So, for example, um, if I, you know, think it's important for the board to make a decision about something and I call each of the board members individually and ask what they think about the issue or what their position is on the issue, then I've created a hub and spoke serial meeting violation. Mm -hmm. 
um, daisy chain, the best way to think about it is like a telephone game. So if I call Director Swan and say, what do you think about X? Um, and then he calls, and I, I may just intend for the conversation to be between me and him. But if he then doesn't sort of understand or comply by the, the Brown Act limitations and calls Director Fultz and asks him the same question, and then Director Fultz calls Director Smallman and so on, now we have a daisy chain, serial meeting violation, as soon as the third director gets involved in the, in the conversation or the communication. <laughs> This, this serial meeting problem can be created by any method of communication in person. If three board members sit down to dinner together and instead of talking about how their kids are doing at school, talk about um, what they think about con contracting with individuals within the district instead of outside the district, that's a serial meeting violation. Well, that's actually just a straight up Brown Act violation. If it's done in this hub and spoke way, daisy chain way, in-person telephone, email, any combination of those, you can have a serial meeting problem. I put social media question mark on here because, um, if you could go to the next slide. The law hasn't really caught up to social media. We don't really have much case law attorney general opinions um, and so on that tell us exactly how these Brown Act rules and serial meeting rules apply in the social media online context, but of course we can draw a lot of inferences based on just how the general principles work with email, telephone, in-person meetings, so on. We can get a good understanding of how a court um, or any decision-making body would apply the Brown Act to social media in the social media environment. We all know social media is increasingly pervasive. Um, everyone's using it, especially younger folks, um, and it is rapidly evolving which creates some problems because, you know, sometimes folks use social media without thinking about what the Brown Act or other implications are because they're just not used to thinking of social media within these sort of legal constructs. Right, so some characteristics you're probably familiar with with social media. I'm not going to start sort of listing all the different types of social media that you could be on. Most of you are probably familiar with some more than others. Um, but some characteristics you're probably aware of is that there's a, usually a mix of public and private communications um, depending on what kind of privacy settings you have, depending on who you communicate with, depending on whether you're using like a person-to-person -person messenger or whether you're using something that posts information that anybody can see. Um, there are no private conversations. Okay, we're getting to that, yeah. That's why you will notice throughout the presentation that private is always in quotation marks. And that's because uh, anything that you sort of think is private or is private at one time can very rapidly become public. So I, I, that sort of will always appear in quotation marks. Um, but regardless of whether you're using sort of more private or more public features or what social media platform you're using, um, it does provide rapid sharing of all kinds of information. If we get the next slide. So there's some positives you know, that go with this. It's a rapid interactive way to communicate with large numbers of people. If I could get the next slide. There's also risks and negatives, such as the ability to rapidly interactively communicate with large numbers of people. Wait a minute, that's the same thing. <laughs> but there's another risk for those who are involved with public agencies. Um, and that's that there's a heightened potential for Brown Act violations um, due to serial meetings. You could go to the next slide. So, you know, the question gets asked, well, wait, a lot of what's done on social media is sort of public for everyone to see. Isn't that, you know, public and transparent and seemingly in keeping with the purposes of the Brown Act to make the, 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 the deliberations of the legislative body um, more public and transparent? You know, well, maybe. I mean, it may be a more sort of public way to communicate about matters that are of public concern or within the district's jurisdiction. You know, but it really depends. You know, what are your privacy settings and how well do you really understand your privacy settings? Who follows you? You know, who's actually reading what you post? Because it may be public, but that doesn't mean everybody's reading it. Um, but the key under the Brown Act is that you can't avoid a serial meeting just because communications are public and not secret. Under the Brown Act, deliberations happen in the meeting room pursuant to a, an agenda, a properly... It, yeah, oh. do you want to say something, Bill? Yeah, we'll, we'll uh, okay. I have a question. Uh, so we'll, we'll circle back to it okay. at the end. Um, 
And the Attorney General has actually addressed this. There was a situation that arose with uh, bodies developing a consensus by email. They tried to cure the Brown Act violation by making the emails public with the idea that that's sort of consistent with the purposes of the Brown Act to show publicly what they were doing. But that doesn't work. That doesn't cure the violation. Just because the communications are public doesn't make it not a Brown Act violation. The communications about matters within the district's jurisdiction among a majority of the directors has to happen in the, in the boardroom. Okay, so the next slide. So I've got a couple of hypotheticals. I'm almost done. Um, here you... So a couple of hypotheticals. The first one is that a board member posts a press release or an announcement pertaining to district business on a personal Facebook page. Does this violate the Brown Act? Anybody can chime in. Chime in. I see some no's. Does anybody think yes, it does violate the Brown Act? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you it's know. an attorney. It's you know, maybe. maybe. All the answers are maybe. I was going to say, you, you know, when a lawyer asks a question to say maybe, it depends. Okay, so if I could get the next slide. Okay, so pro probably not. Just posting an announcement on a Facebook page or some other public platform or in a newspaper or so on probably doesn't violate the Brown Act. But it's complicated because what if other board members, say it's Facebook, start to like the post? Mm -hmm. Now not only does that mean multiple board members are, are looking at the post and reading it, but it also means they're expressing their opinion about it and starting to develop a consensus outside the boardroom. As soon as you hit a majority participating in this, you have a Brown Act violation. Can you go back one? So then, you know, what if another board member posts a comment, I would vote against this? That's probably even more strong than a like in terms of expressing a viewpoint about what's going on involving district business. It's a little tricky because you know, if one's expressing a positive view and one expresses a negative view, you're not really moving toward a consensus. But this is very risky, sort of yellow card, gray area stuff that should be avoided. Um, as soon as multiple directors start to comment on matters on social media, you have, um, you're getting very close to a Brown Act. You have a potential Brown Act violation, you're getting very close to a Brown Act violation. And it's hard to know whether you've crossed the line because you don't really know who's looked at the material and who's you know, responding to it. Okay, so second and last hypothetical. A board member uses social media to communicate with a few constituents about district business and the board member's views. So let's pretend for a second I was a board member and I have um, a few neighbors who share my concern. <coughs> and I have a little sort of messenger chat going with you know, these three or four people. And we're talking about matters of district business. Is that okay under the Brown Act? No. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah, that's good though. I like to hear I like to hear opinions on both Maybe. sides. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. No, this actually, you know, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, disprove the assumption that the answer to lawyer questions is always maybe because this would not violate the Brown Act in and of itself. However, but, but yeah, there's the but. Um, what if you think this is private, but if it but it's actually not? Um, yeah, and, and again, and I'll ask the question again, how well do you understand your privacy settings? <laughs> Not the slightest. Yeah. <laughs> um, and even if you really understand your privacy settings, and you know, well, you understand your privacy settings, you know nobody's using an alias, you know who you're talking to, what if somebody thinks this is really interesting? I wonder what the other, you know, four directors would think about it, takes a screenshot and emails it to them. Now you have a Brown Act violation. So it's a risky area. And it doesn't mean that you can't use social media when you're a member of a board, but it requires extreme caution. Um, OK, could you get the next slide? And there's some other issues related to it, too. Um, you all are familiar with the Public Records Act. Of course, there can also be you know, discovery when litigation gets filed. Even private communications may be subject to collection and production in some circumstances. Um, and this is the bottom line, and some folks said it earlier, you know, nothing's really ever pr private in quotes everywhere. Nothing's really ever private. Private communications have a way of becoming public. So the takeaways, um, if you're not sure, and this is directed to the board, if you're not sure, and the staff for that matter, if you're not sure whether a social media activity or frankly anything else would violate the law, please consult with counsel. I'm happy to, to take your calls. Um, 
respond to your emails. Most of the time, these kinds of questions are very easy to address. It doesn't take a lot of lawyer time. I, I would much rather, you know, hear before something gets posted or something happens and, and try to help provide some guidance um, rather than hear about it afterwards. And um, the, the final takeaway is that if all the board members wanted to, um, we could craft a policy to set reasonable limits on social media activity. You know, there, there's different ways to deal with these issues. One is everybody just sort of understands the risks with social media and polices their own behavior. Another way is that we could put a policy in place for the whole board saying, you know, here's what board members should and shouldn't do when it comes to social media so that everybody has a uniform set of guidelines to work with. That's really up to you. you know, how you do you have a question? Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> you don't know how to find me, but I do. Yeah. Since I'm a, um, I have a poster on social media, and I got in trouble for this um, as well. Um, I, 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 the not communicating with the, um, my colleagues here is really ingrained with me. So I mean, I, I, you know, I think when I first was elected in Long Pico. We, there was some email was sort of new, and we sort of gotten trouble with that. We knew because there was, a, you know, it was okay if it was two directors, it was okay. So there was some confusion with that, but it was so easy to go into get into a serial meeting, especially with technology and social media and stuff like that. So I, I mean, I hear you, but I, you know, I, if I saw like for example, Bob posted something. And I, I would immediately, you know, there's no way I can like it or dislike it or even have any sort of back and forth. That's a communication. But one-sided, you know, I feel obligated to the public to use social media. And I've always been, that, you know, I, I still want to be able to um, say, this is my position on social media. And this is how I'm voting, etc., um, on social media without having the fear of creating some sort of um, serenity. So, I mean, I think that, that that needs to be established that there's that we can we can still be free as directors to to, to communicate with our public on social media. Yeah. And get some guidelines so that we do not uh, have. Any I think we need the guidelines. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, these are good. These are good points. Okay. These are actually. A, well, this probably should have been a hypothetical number three because. Well, yeah. What if all five of us felt obligated to do the same? Well, exactly. If and one, and by rights, the public may demand that that kind of information be out there. Is that what you have in mind? Right. I mean, that's a great way to say it probably should have been a hypothetical number three, because if you only have one director who's active on social media, it doesn't present such a problem. But if you have, you know, three directors who are routinely telegraphing their positions on social media, you know, then we have a, potentially have a problem. We're in risky territory. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, just to clarify, if, if, if you do this, if we, the board does decide that you know that's not a good thing to do. I, you know, I'm not saying that I, you know, have to do this, but I, I think that I think it can be done. I mean, my opinion is that it can be done without having any sort of some sort of meaning, as long as as the postings from my fellow colleagues aren't a conversation, and def by defined by the Brown Act. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. I mean, so I'm not. Uh, you know, I'm not saying I'm right or not wrong. So. Is there questions from? Yeah. Yes. What is the penalty for violating the Brown Act? <laughs> well, not, not <laughs> she yells at us. <laughs> <laughs> no, <it could> <laughs> no jail time. Right. Bruce Holloway sees it. <laughs> it's, this district has faced challenges on Brown Act issues before. Um, there's a couple ways that can come up. Um, when it has to do with a decision that's actually made in a public meeting, there's um, ways to cure it. There are other types of violations where, you know, the district could be sued to stop a certain type of 
occurrence from happening again. So there's legal risks related to allowing Brown Act violations to occur. It, it's embarrassing to a board member, I guarantee you, to have that possibility. You would not want to knowingly violate the Brown Act. John? Um, it, so uh, maybe I don't understand it correctly, but it's, it almost seems like there's a perverse incentive if you're all on the same social media platform to be the board member that comes out first. Because if you come out first, there is no violation. It's only when other people start weighing in on that same topic. So it, it, this seems to me like a really odd situation where, yeah, you, you're almost rewarded if you come out first. And I don't really have much to say about that other than, well, that's a really odd situation to be in. Uh, Debbie? Well, and besides the Brown Act, there is the respectful workplace policy issue that has been coming up, come up most drastically recently, but also having board members post things like animosity towards a, a neighborhood or a project or a group of people representing something, that's very difficult to read. It, it's um, it's just, I, I, there's a lot of disrespect that's posted just simply because social media is all about you can disrespect people and you can s and speak your mind. So <laughs> I'm concerned about that also. And if there is going to be a policy, I'd like that kind of stuff addressed too. How far can a board member go isolating a person or a part of the community that is being served and not violate the respect? workplace policy, <coughs> or perhaps we need to expand the respectful workplace policy that says you just can't do it in any format, in person, online, anything. I, I think that's being pushed to the edge quite often, too. Is there any other public comments? Yes. Suzanne Shetler, Van Lomond. I was once in a public position, and I was new, and uh, my predecessor, pointed out to me that in a public position, you can only wear one hat. You are that public, you wear your public hat all the time. You never have a private hat, as long as you're in that office, in that public position. And I found that to be really very useful. I can't wear a public hat and a private hat at the same time. My public opinion and my private opinion may diverge somewhat. I may some, say some things in private or do some things in private that would not be appropriate in my public position. And so the one hat rule, I think, works. Any other comments out there? Any other further comments from the board? Uh, so um, is the board wanting you to uh, create a, a policy? That, that's what I'd like to know. Do you want a policy created on social media or, and how it affects, say, perhaps, a uh, respectful workplace? I don't know. I, hmm? I don't know. I personally, I don't know. I, I, I think... Uh, uh, Steve? I, I, I think it might be valuable to mm -hmm. let council draft something that specifically outlines what can and can't be done or what's acceptable or list more hypotheticals or whatever, just so that there are some concrete guidelines that we can make sure are easy to see if they're followed or not. Uh, I agree with Director Swan. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I also, yeah, and I also think, and I agree with Director Swan, and I also think that that work will dovetail with our future uh, website and communications work where we may have some support in and guidance in how to communicate better with our constituents and the public and other peers. So, yes. I, I, I mean, I do, I, I agree with you, but I, I do agree that there should, should be some consideration with it, with, um, with what I said earlier about, um, you know, letting, having, being, as a director, I enjoy my freedom of communicating to the public my position and, and um, serving the public and I think there's a pertinent connection there but I could see I could see where the line could go overboard 
in the wrong direction. Well, we have, there are limitations already yeah. that we have to observe, right? I mean, yeah. some of us write letters to the local newspaper, right? And there are limitations as to what we can document or state in there mm -hmm. without violating any of the same principles that we're talking about here in mm -hmm. law. So I don't think that, you know, we take a page from what we currently do and add that into policies. I think everything is going to be could be very reasonable for everybody. You still have nobody's nobody's denying free speech, right? The First Amendment's here for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, but a, again, as a director, there are certain restrictions and limitations that you need to be able to abide by. I think it gets tricky in that. So, for example, the comments that were happening in the next door, I'm not on that next door neighborhood. There were private conversations relative to me until someone took a screenshot yeah. and emailed them. Um, and I think that goes to your point earlier about the, the fact that none of it is um, private, whether you think it is or not. Um, you know, I, I generally like to see board members decide um, what speech they want to do, but the perverse incentive is is a problem, and that's why I'm still on the fence about whether or not we would invest the time and energy right now in, in doing that. Um, I won't say no, but I, I'm not I'm not I'm not there yet. The the other issue I would think that need to be addressed is is criticizing staff on social media. I I think that. I, I, it just seems wrong to me that you criticize staff. It's bad enough. Uh, actually, we shouldn't criticize any staff members, even during a meeting. I, I mean, I guess we could beat up on Rick if we wanted to. Um, because he could beat us up. Yeah. But I, I mean, basically, so any of you who are new don't realize this. If you, if you did a flow chart of responsibility, the board's up here. We have two people we're responsible for, Rick Rogers and our attorney. And, they, and Rick Rogers uh, deals with all the staff. We don't deal with staff. It's not our place to criticize them uh, either here or on social media. I think that's a very and extremely important thing to, to include in, in, in uh, the recommendation. That's covered in the respectful workplace yeah, policy yeah. too yeah. as well. Yeah. Is there any, do we have to recreate the, the wheel so to speak, or are there any policies out there that we could I piggyback looked, off of? In preparing this presentation I looked for some of the samples that we have internally and I have a good one for um, the specific purpose that we were addressing here, which is balancing um, elected officials' First Amendment protections with Brown Act issues. Um, personally, I think that there are other documents that are better vehicles for some of the other issues that were expressed, such as the Respectful Workplace Policy and such as the Board Manual, where it has a discussion of how board members should interact with each other. Um, and maybe those should be revisited as well. But I do have a good sample, and I guess what I'm proposing is something that would talk about balancing First Amendment protections with Brown Act, against Brown Act issues specifically, um, rather than a more global treatment of you know, what can or should be said or shouldn't be said online. So it doesn't sound like it would be a huge lift then to get something for the board to review. No, it would not. Okay. To leverage the other districts. So, yeah. so maybe, maybe take that to the admin committee for a kickoff once you prepare a demon and then kind of go from there. So if it went to that, is that agreeable for it to go to the admin committee <coughs> and then come back to the board? Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Yep. All right. Okay. Good. All right. Um, I, I think. The next item, our last item, unless I'm wrong here, is our finance and business service department workshop. Could we, uh, could we take this
Oh, can we have five minutes? A five minute break. Okay. We have important stuff here. Does that mean you have a different hat on, Rick? I'm getting ready to start the snipe. You take your public hat off and put your private hat on. Are these your glasses? Yes, I don't need them. Yeah, this is your stuff, so I can sit down and stand up and sit down. Sure.
you can see something seemed to have gone on February 13th. So you can actually drill down and see the hourly consumption of what that meter read. Um, this happens to be my personal home <laughs> account. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that we were leaving for vacation on the 13th. When I got to on my vacation and saw this, I was like, what's going on? Um, so I actually had SLV operations staff go out and shut off my water because I very clearly had a leak. Uh, we woke up at about 3 a.m., left the house, and consistent 25 gallons. Came home, found a small leak in one of the toilet flat valves. So it just kept going down, kept refilling, kept going down, kept refilling. Um, so it is a very powerful tool that we're trying to get in the hands of our customers. Right now we have about 1,500 in our system. Um, and operations is working hard. They're putting in about 500 or so each year. And as we finish uh, the routes, we then send out information to the customers for how they can sign up for this. Now this, the ones in Long, I know that Long Pico got smart meters. Long Pico has it, Olympia Mutual, and mm -hmm. then um, it's heavy down in the Felton area because a lot of the old uh, so the, Neptune meters but there. Then how do people get the app? The, the app or the, so we sent the out, if we didn't have people's yeah. email addresses, we sent an email. Mm -hmm. If we didn't have that, we sent a, a flyer to the home telling people how to get into this. Now, uh, Long Pico does have some cell service issues to where they have manual endpoints to where we're still having to go out and read. Mm -hmm. So those individuals wouldn't be able to get daily or hourly. They would simply be able to get monthly. Oh, data. simply because of the bad cell service? Mm -hmm. or, or, exactly. Or. Um, I'm not going to dive into this too much. I have copies of the article back there. Um, but this is a really good report written by Delo Deloitte and Touche um, addressing the current water infrastructure crisis facing the nation. It's not just our water system that's aging and needing be, to be replaced. Uh, pretty much a lot of the infrastructure all went in around semi the same time across the nation and it's all hitting its useful life. Uh, AWWA, American Water Works Association, is estimating it's going to be at least a trillion dollars over the next 25 years to replace the pipes. That's not anything new construction going in, that's not even dealing with repairing treatment plants. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see some of the different <sighs> policies that come out, monies that maybe the government offers. Um, we are seeing some of those, and so the district is always trying to get any sort of grant funding that we can to maintain a safe drinking system. About the district, um, to know where we're going, we kind of have to understand a little bit of the past to figure out, you know, kind of how we've gotten. San Lorenzo Valley is a closed water system, so we're sole sourced. It's our surface water, it's our wells, we have two treatment plants. It's different than Hetch Hetchy up on, up on the wall that you see there, where there's massive reservoirs where they are piping millions and millions of gallons into the San Francisco Bay area, also then wholesaling and making money off of that sort of stuff. So there are different nuances to each individual water district for how you get your water. Um, so while some move here to get away from some of those high housing costs over the hill or in Santa Cruz, there is in turn a cost associated with having a wide spread out mountain water system. Um, in short, we're maintaining more miles of pipe with less customers. So here's some statistics pulled from um, us, SoCal Creek Water District and Scotts Valley Water District. And it just kind of gives you a picture of what is unique to our area. So we have 7,900 customers, so literally half of Soquel Creeks. And we are actually maintaining more miles of pipeline than they are. Um, so from a purely financial aspect, you could think or argue that we would have to be charging double our 7,900 customers to even be able to make what they are. Um, below has some of the different ratios, kind of showing what number of customers to the operating revenue, expenses. Um, you know, you look at the three agencies, the ratio of their revenue to expenses, all of us are relatively similar ballpark, about 80%. Um, miles of pipeline to customers, I mean, that's where it's becoming very clear that for a mile of pipe, we're serving 46 customers. For a mile of pipe, Soquel Creek's serving 95. 
it's just a gross difference in economies of scale for having a, you know, tight suburban neighborhood where you're able to effectively have a lot easier connections versus the mountains that we're in where we have to span very far and wide. Um, so miles of pipeline to revenue. For every mile of pipe, we're only generating $59,000 in revenue, where Soquel Creek is $124,000, even Scotts Valley is at $110,000. Here's a view of the past 10 years. Uh, so this is all data that you can find in the statistical section of our <coughs> annual audits. Um, it's showing the operating revenues and operating expenses over the past 10 years, and then we overlay the units of water that were, was sold. So as you can see, pre-drought, so 2014 and earlier, customers were using around 800,000 units or so. Drought came in and hit, and 14, 15, and there's been over a 20% decrease. That obviously directly is going to impact the district's revenues. Um, we'll, the 20% decrease will come up again in a later slide. Let me talk about the elephant in the room. Rate history. Um, water rates are one of the top concerns of our customers for good reason. Um, it's a financial impact on them, but it's also what they're paying is supposed to be going towards the district's mission statement of maintaining safe, reliable water for future generations. So you want to know that where your money is going to is, is being well spent. Um, so there's no denying large increases in the past and current. Here is a 20-year view of a customer, you know, if a customer used four units of water over the last 20 years. Um, 1999, that bill would have cost them $21.38, and today it would be costing them $73.56. Um, so, I mean, it definitely is a significant growth. So, compound annual growth rate, what that's doing is saying, forget about all of the different variations and increases in the different years. What would it have been if we level loaded it? So, it would have equated to the district raising rates 6.72% every single year is what the equivalent would have been. So you can see some years didn't have hardly any, then you have some jumps, then you have it die down, then you have some jumps again. So now, <coughs> this is just high level, and I'd say semi-fact, but still partially my opinion. Two main reasons for the current situation. Um, the, 20, the 2013 rate study was for the increases that you see occurring in 14, 15, and 16. That was done before the drought had even hit. So back then, all of the projections that they used to decide what revenues needed to be generated was back at about an 800,000 unit revenue base. Um, so instantly, we were going to be in the hole to a certain degree. The 2013 study showed that there was five years of approximately 11% increases each year needed. Um, for whatever reason, only three years were adopted. So I started here in 2014 where we had rate increases going into effect. We had monthly billing starting right away. Um, and in seeing all this stuff, when we were coming up needing to do the 2017 rate study, I already knew that it wasn't going to be pretty. How could it be when the 20% reduction had occurred? And even the other study had showed there were more years than the three years adopted that were needed. So that just kind of has led us into part of the, the reason some of the results of the 2017 study. Um, now I'm going to go into what makes a government public company different than the private sector. Um, they're focused on serving the public versus profit driven. So private is for profit period. If you run inefficiently, you go under. If you're a publicly traded company, you have shareholders wanting to see your earnings per share. Um, where the public side, we're having to deal with balancing socioeconomics that sometimes you're going to have to spend money on something that's not going to give you a return on investment because the socioeconomic benefit is deemed greater. Um, Procurement process is drawn out. 
quite literally the bureaucratic red tape. I mean, everything takes longer in the public sector as well. Everything needs to be done in a public forum, if it needs to go out to bid. So you're requiring a lot more stuff, even down to hiring a new employee. If there's a new position that you want to create, it's probably going to take about a year to do so in a public agency, let alone hiring, and about the same amount of time for if you need to let someone go. Versus the private sector, you can hire, you can fire, you can pretty much do a lot of different stuff, you know, pivot very quickly versus the restrictions of a public agency. We do face unique accountability. Um, there is a lot more reporting. We have annual audits that we have to do. We have to do annual budgets. Um, so while the mom and pop shops can get away with having a bookkeeper, file your taxes, you're good to go. Um, any of the private sector that are you know, traded publicly, they are having to follow more, more scrutiny. They are having to file 10 Qs and 10 Ks where I don't know if you ever listened to any of those. It's pretty much a sales pitch and how they're, they didn't make enough money, they're going to make enough money the next, you know, the next earnings call. Um, you don't have as much back and forth as you do with the public here. We have a lot of different meetings that go into developing all of our staff. Responding to crisis situations, similar. A private sector produces a product, doesn't go well you can decide to stop selling that product. If you have multiple manufacturing plants, you can shut down a manufacturing plant to cut costs. You don't have that in a public sector, especially in something like a water district. We can't choose to stop operating our lion treatment plant because certain expenses are getting too high. Um, you can always work on ways to move towards figuring out solutions, but you can't just simply pivot and we saw that simply with even the drought. Um, it was a direct hit to the revenues. The drought surcharge had to go into effect to help supplement the fact that there's a lot of fixed costs with running a water district that you can't just scale back um, at the drop of a hat. More boring stuff. Accounting principles and regulations. Um, we're governed by GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles. Um, it's created to have uniform accounting so that you can look at our financials, you can look at Soquel Creeks, um, and even once you get into the Secu Securities Exchange Commission, any, any publicly NASDAQ-like traded companies, they have to follow GAAP as well. Um, you know, but any other private small company doesn't need to. GASB is then the independent body that helps uh, guide and provide oversight on, on GAAP. Uh, private sector, FASB is what would be the equivalent, the uh, Financial Accounting Standards Board. We operate off of fund accounting, um, so it's a proprietary enterprise fund. We actually have two. We have the water and we have the sewer. And essentially it is, you need to collect enough money from your ratepayers to be able to pay for the services that you're providing. So the sewer is considered separate. That's why you will see us having um, on the audit, certain aspects will have the sewer broken out separately. We budget the sewer fund separately as well. We operate off of accrual basis versus cash basis. So we record revenues when they're earned and expenses when they are incurred. Um, audit basis versus budget base basis will differ slightly. We do have a hard year-end close, so this is when all of the different accrual analyses are being done. A good example is consumption revenue. So you receive your bill in July. It's going to be covering a approximately a 30-day period, say June 15th to July 15th of your consumption. Um, what we're required to do is go back and prorate those 15 days and book it back into being June 30th. Because that's essentially what you have to do is, if it's earned or if you incurred it, as of 6.30, it needs to be reflected on your books. This is where our books stay open for a month or two after June 30th, because any invoices coming in that say that it's for work that was performed in the prior fiscal year, we have to book accruals and get all of those back into there. Um, so sometimes when you look at the budget versus actuals on a monthly basis, 
um, more particularly for June and July, it may look a little bit skewed because we're having to take all of that July revenue that would normally be budgeted for and move it per the audit. Or our property liability insurance typically comes in one big bill. Um, so that's going to be just a single hit in the month of July versus it being spread evenly over the 12, the 12 months. It's a difference between accrual and cash. Exactly, accrual and cash, um, all kinds of different stuff. That we, there's even modified accrual. We don't have to do that, thankfully. Um, accounting versus financial reporting. So accounting essentially is all of the detailed information internally that comes through. That's the purchase orders, invoices, packing slips, matching all up to the who, what, and why, coding it to if it's for a capital project, whatnot, and then all of that leads to recording the journal entry. Um, we have approximately 13,000 journal transactions per year, and so all of this accounting information is then what flows into our internal reports, external reports, and any special reporting that we're doing. Um, some of the keys to financial reporting is it should be in a usable form for those who need it. External reports that we produce, we have the annual budget and the annual audit as two of the larger ones. Those typically have multiple committee reviews. We have a special board meeting typically to do a deep dive into those two. But then on a monthly and quarterly basis, we have the financial reports that are in the finance status report. And so monthly is doing a little bit higher level, quarterly is starting to dive in a little bit more and comparing against prior year and how you're comparing against the actual budget. The internal reports are essentially the same as the above, except for department staff are reviewing at the transactional level. There's six key characteristics in financial reporting understandability, reliability, relevance, timeliness, consistency, and comparability. So these are considered kind of the best practices of what should be making up your financial reporting. Um, to me, understandability and relevance are the ones that kind of stand out. Uh, if I were to attempt to hit people with 13,000 transactional data, people would go cross-eyed. Um, that is part of why we have um, the general ledger, categorize different different reports. Um, so those 13,000 transactions are going into one of 440 general ledger accounts that we have. 255 of those are the department operating expense accounts. And then these are categorized into six main categories. You'll see the same six categories in the audit as we do in the budget as in the monthly and quarterly financial reporting. So that way you're able to have an easier way of being able to understand the, the relation of them all. The six categories are salaries and benefits, contract professional services, operating expenses, maintenance and facility. While they all are relatively, you know, they could be lumped into one, we do break them out, out separately. Uh, and then general and administrative is going to be all the other miscellaneous postage, office supplies, it's where our water conservation programs hit, and our insurance bills. Budget process. So right now we are in the budget preparation process. This is where department heads are gathering all of the different data so that they can come up with what they want to request for the upcoming budget. What I would like to do is enhance this more with the board having more so a kickoff meeting. This all is going in line with wanting to get that GFOA award. One of the main things is tying all of your different uh, strategic plans and goals back into the budget. So if there's certain goals and objectives that the board wants to meet for that year, it's better for staff to be able to have, a, for all of us to be on the same page so that when we're preparing our budgets, we can keep some of that stuff in mind. Um, so the next budget and finance committee, we're gonna have uh, another roll up of, of the budget. And that's kind of the budget review process. So that's where committee's looking at it, the board will start to get some views of it, and that leads us to the budget approval to where it's getting formally presented and adopted. Um, and again, that's typically a special meeting with that being the only thing on the agenda. That way, you can talk about it for a couple hours without worrying about five other things on, on the agenda. 
after all that's done, we're monitoring uh, all the outcomes and analyzing the variances. So this is where you'll see our monthly reports. Um, water districts while it's exciting, it's not crazy exciting from a financial standpoint. All your money is essentially coming in from your customers. Um, the expenses, for the most part, are fixed. Um, it's not like you have a new product launch and you're able to see some cool profit margins or you know marketing department expenditures. You know we don't really have a ton of stuff behind it, but nonetheless, it's important to always go and do a review. Here's a snapshot, we'll get into some of these a little bit later, um, but this is essentially the revenues, expenses, and changes in reserves um, that's in our current fiscal year 18-19 budget. So you see the operating income, the non-operating revenue, um, debt payments and the interest related, and the capital funding needed. And so that'll give you what the estimated increase or decrease in reserves are going to be. Um, another thing that we're working on in the budget and finance is getting a better fine-tuned reserve fund policy with setting some of the target levels that we want to have. You can The board can create multiple levels that they want to specifically designate. Come up with ways of how you want to fund them. Um, the only time you start to get restricted is if you have restricted revenue, um, such as some of our debt covenants require us to hold X amount of money specifically for them. Similarly, any special assessment districts, um, like the Lompico Assessment District, those monies cannot be spent on other district functions. They have to be spent on what that assessment district is for. So therefore, it holds them as being restricted as well. Uh, chart version we have in there as well. So we have roughly a $15.9 million budget currently. Um, you could see that the majority is being spent on operating expenses. Um, while the capital improvement says 6.1 million, that's not going to be what's getting spent. That's kind of one of the goals and trajectories that I want us to get better at. We talked about the Budget and Finance Committee where forecasting the capital projects and getting realistic timelines to be able to put in the budget are important because otherwise you have something here that the reality is going to end up being a different looking pie chart at the end of the day. Um, right now we've spent about 1.5 million. We do have some extensive projects coming up like the probation tank where we're going to have close to 2 million coming out here semi soon. Um, but not nearly the I mean, it'd be great if we could spend $6 million, just at least for this fiscal year. That, that's not going to really be the reality. So the main sections of the reports you've kind of seen are the revenues, expenses, capital projects. And so what ends up happening is, and this is a picture from the budget, don't worry, you don't need to be able to see it. The next <laughs> couple slides are going to be just snippets out so you can get a visual example. Um, so there's typically narrative. There's something explaining, you know, in this case it's the revenue summary. There's the tables that's breaking down the different categories. And then a lot of times there's a chart that's helping to give a more visual graphic of it. Um, so in this case you're able to see that, you know, almost, I mean all the money for the most part is coming from the, the consumption, um, the consumption and basic. Again, here it is in, in a similar a similar chart. And so you're seeing the operating expenses broken into those six categories. Those are then going to get broken down by department. So each department then has those categories related to it that are all what's feeding up to it. So this is the Finance and Business Services Department. It's showing what the proposed budget is, what the prior year adopted, and what that prior year's estimated actuals are going to be coming in at, and then showing some of the variances. We then go and explain any variances to the prior year budget and any variances to the prior year estimated actuals. If there's any large items that are making up those different sections, those will be broken out in separate bullet points to be able to see. And then a lot of times all of these have some sort of trend data. So you can see for the most part it was steady as she goes for 2011 through 2015. 
and then it started to tick down. Part of that was a restructuring of this department in particular. It went from being just finance to we have we pulled in, um, we created the HR position and the field customer service um, positions all came underneath this department now. Revenue budget, straightforward. You can start to see the shift in uh, the rate increase and structure how you're seeing more water usage coming in than the prior year. It's still gonna be extremely variable due to consumption. Capital projects are all listed out in summary, showing you the funding type for how we plan on paying for these projects, any money spent in the prior year, what we plan to spend in the current year, and what we anticipate the future year. So it's getting you an idea for the total project costs. Similar then it all gets broken down into more detail. So you'll have a detailed explanation as to what that project is. Um, if there's pictures that we have that are good, that's great. This is the probation tank that's um, gonna be having a lot of action here coming up semi soon. Hopefully, Hopefully yes. Uh, so the budget versus actual comparisons. So the monthly finance status report has a high level by month year-to-date and trend analysis. It's comparing against the prior year and annual budget and looks at expenses by the high-level category. Then on a quarterly basis, it's the same thing except for we add in a management discussion analysis and we then break down the departmental expenses by category, what the capital project expenditures are, um, and any of the non-operating and debt-related items. We'll pull up what this most recent quarterly report was at the end of this so people can kind of get a high-level a high level idea of that. Um, future budget goals, add more trend analysis and revenue expense history, better define and tie back into reserve fund policy, and the requirements for us to apply for the GFO A Distinguished Budget Presentation Award is not going to only be myself doing legwork. Um, they really want to have the district being the board and the individual departments really spell out the strategic goals and objectives for that fiscal year and for upcoming. Um, and so it needs to be a measurable thing that we can actually look at and be able to move forward with. And so part of that all plays into uh, presenting a long range financial plan and we'll add a glossary showing all the different abbreviations and acronyms in it. Um, one of the other things that I would like us to do is we'll have the engineer coming on soon. My report simply from a capital standpoint is saying what we've spent. James does a good job in his department status reports of explaining the projects a little bit more and where we are with those. Um, the idea is to have a collaborative report that's explaining how much we spent, how the projects are going, um, and I think a lot of that is planned to play into once we have um, the engineering department beefed up to be able to help provide some more insight to that. Again, budget package, reserve fund policy. Those are the things where you want to be part of it. Come to the next handful of budget and finance committee meetings. That is pretty much going to be the only thing I'm talking about um, unless something really important comes up. Uh, future, there's certain policies and procedures I want to go over. Uh, surplus water, fire service, there's a whole lot. Um, even more on understanding customer assistance programs and the limitations that being a public agency has. Um, we get the question a lot of times from low income or how come you don't have low income or senior rates that you can offer, PG&E does, or they came from CalAM and CalAM does. And that's again where the private and public sector don't always see eye to eye. Um, there's California statutes that prevent gift of public funds, Prop 218, from charging one customer class more to subsidize another. So there's a lot of different quirks that prevent us. There are certain ways that we could um, try and work around that stuff. And so we want to bring that back to the Budget and Finance Committee. Website, if you were at the Admin Committee uh, yesterday or the day before, we have a RFP that we'll be bringing to the board on the 21st. 
um, to hopefully be able to go out for a new website. So that'll be a very collaborative effort um, since every single one of us here have some sort of vested interest in the website. The Johnson Building and any other asset opportunities is something we'll be talking about again. Um, seeing if the district really needs the Johnson property for future plans. If not, uh, this summer would be an excellent time to sell it and capitalize while the market is still very high. Um, and then any other asset, asset opportunities that we have. Uh, public outreach, finances, increased e-billing and auto pay. I would really like to get some sort of, oh, even if it's just internal or on the website, figure out some way to help push this a little bit more. Um, it literally can save money for you and the district. When you think of how many bills we have going out, you know, the real cost that the district can save on is paper and postage. So if people are signing up for electronic billing and no longer receiving their paper bill, that's, that's saving. Um, anyone that's signing up for that is probably a little bit more likely to use the website for auto pay or at least a one-time payment online. So that's going to save the person from mailing something in, etc. Um, yeah. How much do you think it would, uh, let's say, ha let's say, I don't know, well, say the entire <coughs> district was all on online pay, how much would that save per year? <laughs> well, paperless billing, it'd be saving definitely a chunk of change, you know. Mm -hmm. I'd have to go rent, but somewhere around ten thousand, probably. Ten thousand, yeah. Um, the everyone making payments online is a double-edged sword because you have transaction fees. If people are paying by credit cards, you have credit card fees. Mm -hmm. um, I just got done beating up our transaction fee people to get a reduction in that. But I mean, as as those increase, and for the most part. Um, I haven't seen any water districts that charge you a fee for using a credit card. Essentially, the customers are paying for that anyways because what, you know, whatever our credit card processing fees are going into what's making up the rate. So it's kind of full circle that way. Um, only place I see charge is the county. When you go to pay your property taxes, if you want to pay by credit card, they're getting you with like the 3% transaction fee. It seems to me that the district could make more money if we could convince people to give up their plastic bottles of water and use their own water because a lot of people are not using water from the district. They're only buying water in plastic bottles and it seems like Somehow we got to get people convinced that the water is safe or use a, some kind of filter at home if they can't be convinced of that. But I, I think that maybe it's not that much, but I think it might be a lot. Yeah, yeah. it definitely, I mean, that definitely all adds up. There's different ways that you can incentivize people to sign up for e-bills, you know, uh, and automatic payments. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Gina, but you can, the district could offer some sort of incentive program where if you sign up for these two things, you get entered to win something. If it's created. Uh, so it sounds like it could be created consistently. I've seen other, uh, and that's one of the recommendations from some of the different um, conferences that I've gone to that they've done. Enter for all of this, you can win an iPad. It could be enter, you know, sign up for these two things and you get entered to win a free, you know, non disposable water bottle type of a deal. I have two questions. Um, 440 accounts, can you go back to that and say what are those 440 accounts? So 255 of them are the operating expenses. So that's going to be, you know, the salaries and benefits category is not just one GL account. That's going to have what the actual salaries are, what overtime is, what, you know, the FICA taxes, the different things that make up that. So by far the majority of it is coming from the operating expenses, though, you know, a postage account, um, different stuff like that where you wouldn't want to sit there and show in 255 accounts. That's why they are, they are categorized. 
The rest of them are, for the most part, going to be all your balance sheet accounts. So all of the different um, fixed asset categories that we have, the corresponding accumulated depreciation that's going to be going into that. Um, those are all the different, you know, the basic ones then, you know, accounts receivable, accounts payable, all the different GL accounts. And my second question was, and had to do with the low-income um, senior citizen, not discount, 218 prevents us from doing that. Uh, but, and you and I, and we've had conversations about this going for a few years. Yeah. It's my hobby horse to figure out some way of doing something like a voluntary pay-it-forward kind of program where the district is providing a landing page where on our website they can voluntarily contribute some portion, whether it's rounding up their bill, like you can do on some, you know, charity, for some charities, or if there's a special campaign of some sort that we can say, please contribute to this other organization who is running this for us or with us. But I understand that the Springbrook accounting system is sort of well awkward to work with. Rolling that. a bill up would require it to be administered by us, right. right? Right. If it was something where there's a third party that you partner with, and it's <coughs> very clear that it's a third party, but you have the link on your page to where someone can make their donation, I'm all for that because that's taking the burden off of us. Because if it was something where you have the option to round up your bill and it's happening through our system, I'm going to need to have, see all of their checks and balances and to mm -hmm. make sure that that money is going into their account. I mean, essentially, I would want to hold some responsibility for making sure that that's checking out. That's auditable. But right. if it's something where, you know, Valley Churches is probably one of the number one places that we do point people to that is mm -hmm. able to offer some assistance, if they were interested in partnering up to where people can make donations specifically to people being able to help pay their water bill, I'm all for something like that because essentially it's removing the district from the main equation. When you see um, some of the cities or counties offering these programs, they're massive. You know, they can afford to have a person that's administering this program. Mm -hmm. I can't hire someone to, mm -hmm. to you know, the economies of scale for it. I mean, that's where being a small water district, but we're not that small because we do have a lot of customers. I keep thinking there's just got to be some way of solving that riddle. I wish, that Mr. Works for I wish Mr. Stone would take that to the legislature and try to get that done. They have a super majority. I don't understand what the issue is. I hear it all the time from all the people. They want some kind of tiered rates. It, they just don't understand why they, they can, can't provide they it. Can, I mean, well, it's, no, I understand that. But the legislature, who has a super majority, can easily put that on the ballot and sell it. And for whatever reason, he refuses to do so. I don't understand. So again, a lot of this is high level, mainly because I can't sit here and do a deep dive into our audit and our budget all at the same time. We'd be here till midnight. Um, but if you want, we can go ahead and pull up the Q2 report. Sure. Do you, do you want to put, it said questions. You want yeah. questions? Oh, yeah, now? if you, anyone else has questions. A question. Could you go back to the slide that showed the increases by year from 2000 yes. to present? If not, I can just, I think I've got the numbers off of my head, but I, no, I can, just in case I get it wrong. I wanna, to get to, uh, there, was a, there was also a period of time in the 90s where the rates went up like zero. I, I don't know. Oh, yeah, I mean, before. even so, elephant in the room. As, now we're getting close. As Rick remembers very okay. well. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, so if you look even before that, there's a whole yeah, chunk of There's a whole decade so, is there. Here's my question. Are you saying that the, the consumption drop of twenty percent in two thousand fourteen was the cause of the rate increase of forty percent in two thousand seventeen? Is that your is that your statement? So that's what I heard. I just want to make sure I, So is well, that the, the twenty thirteen one was making up for the obvious prior years that didn't have a lot of increases. That was being based on 800,000 units of water, um, and it projected five years of 11% increase where only three years were adopted. So, but again, do, do you believe that the consumption decrease directly led to the rate increase? Oh, absolutely. Okay, I, I don't agree. And if people are consuming less, the district is literally making less money. Significant. Well, I, I'm not going to argue that. What I'm, I'm going to say is I think it. Because the argument is basically that it's volume dependent, and I don't think it's nearly as volume dependent as, as we think. But it, my, my, my point is, 
where can I bring this discussion up? So I can, because I've done some analysis based on the numbers from the, the website. Mm -hmm. Where can I go and have this discussion? Is it with you one-on-one? -on -one? Does it come to an, a financial um, committee meeting? I, I don't want to take a lot of people's time, but right. I do want to have my, myself, my you know, thoughts heard. About like the about the past rate study. Well, about about the whole analysis of you know the consumption versus expense because I think the expense ramp up happened long before the consumption drop in my analysis. So I'm just you know where do I have that discussion? Well, you can see. Well, I don't. I, I don't this, argue I mean, here because I, I, I mean you see it's, 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 it's relatively proportional. It's there. relatively proportional. I don't think it's that simple. But I you know again we're. Where can I? I, I, would talk tell you, to I would tell you to contact the chair of the budget, the finance committee, and talk to them about getting something on the, the, the Who's committee. Who's the chair of the budget committee? I'm Mr. Fultz. Oh, Mr. Fultz, and Thank talk you. and get Thank something, you. have him put something on the agenda for the budget and finance. Well, committee. no, I want to sit down and talk and to show what I've got so well, that you can then that's, that's where you could do that. Okay. So, that's know, the hard part, is it has I to will be. will contact a, Mr. Fultz. Yeah, and it would be at a public session, and you'd have. The committee there, and Stephanie there, and I would be there, and we would talk about that item. Okay. So, for example, I think inflation, just for um, comparison purposes, twenty-one dollars in 1999. So the inflation factor, just your broad CPI, not any particular industry, that bill would be thirty-one sixty-five in 2018, just on inflation, according to the online calculator. So um, over twenty years. Over twenty years. Ten bucks. Fifty percent increase. Fifty. It 50 might be. Increase. I mean, there so, is a there is a specific water well, loss. I, I, yeah. I'm just talking about the g generic CPI, but I think from a public perception point of view, that gets down to the issue: is that the, the water rates have been going up at an enormously uh, higher rate than oh. anywhere close to inflation. And it really it pinches people. I mean, people that make fifty thousand a year in their household, seeing a hundred dollar uh, a month bill. Oh yeah. It, when you take out taxes and social security and all that, it is, it is a non-trivial amount of their budget, and that's where it starts to hurt people. Yeah. I think that's why you. you yes, yeah, a six point seven each year. I mean, that's that, that's, that's huge. steep that's to have as an that's ongoing basis. Way above. You know, part of it ties into compound. Growing pains. I mean, part of this whole aging infrastructure thing across. But but the issue is the infrastructure. All the rate increases again. The perception is all the rate increases in the past have not gone to infrastructure. In exactly. fact, I think we sold the probation tank how many times, Rick? No. <laughs> 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 right. So it, it, it's like the it's like the operating expenses expanded to meet the available money that was that was there from the rate increases. And so the infrastructure didn't get done. And after two or three times of that, the public's going to say time out. Right. So this is where it's incumbent upon us collectively as a group, a team, to basically say we're not going to do that again. We're going to figure out a way here to control this so that we can actually put money in the infrastructure. And I mean, I wasn't here for the prior rate study, so I don't, I mean, I saw the reports. I saw some of the background detail for what went into it. Um, I was here for the 2017 one. Um, there was a whole lot of deep dives and everything going in, and it's a major increase. Like, there's no denying that. Um, We're trying to catch up for years and not. But the other thing is, we don't have reserves. A yeah. huge problem. Well, that's where, well, this, huge problem. this rate increase was drastic. I do think it is the rip the band-aid off approach to where we shouldn't have to see increases like that again. Um, the rate study is factoring in the capital that we needed. It did factor in building the reserves back up. Um, so those are some of the key... But we've had... Okay, we've had the second increase, right? Go into the third. We've had the second increase, and we still don't have reserves. We still don't have. But the study showed that. The study showed yeah. that we were not going to be hitting our reserve level levels until I think it was year four that we would start to put more towards that. Yes. Yeah. Everything's going capital. But, but those reserves were pathetic. They were reasonable. Two million dollars for capital. 
not reasonable. Well, that's the reserve fund. Oh, reserve yeah. fund. It's okay. not reasonable. Right. It's it's not adequate. Uh, that that's the better word. It's not adequate. You won't hear me argue. Well, but I would, my concern is you know because we saw like you know some of the bids that came out. The market for contractors is. You know, we, that last, the markups are crazy. Yeah. Like and, really you know, it. that's why I think we're going to really save a lot of money with the in-house engineering and construction department. Um, um, and well, anyway, just, yeah. I think that's one of my concerns is that we're going to have all these projects come up that we want to get going, and we're going to see these marked up bills. I'd like to add about the operating expense. Yes. Yeah. This district neglected forever, and we were so spread thin forever. We're finally getting the employees that we need, and we're still short-handed. And that's where the majority of the operating expense increase has come from in the past four years. We've added people to our staff that are important and needed, and we're finally starting to catch up on some stuff around here. Um, it's nice to be seeing some project, capital improvements projects finally hitting the ground. Yeah, you're right. They didn't happen. They were sold to you guys four or five times, sold to the public. But what wasn't sold to the public was the uh, huge, was the boost in the staffing and why it was necessary. It's all about setting expectations when you do these things. If the expectations are sold to the public, then we're going to get lots of capital improvement projects. And then none of them happen right. within a four-year period. Public is going to say, uh uh, fool me once, you know, shame on me, fool me twice, shame on you. But now and I can say you see happening. it moving forward now. We're going to, but we're going to have to take a look at the expenses. Right. Yeah. I'm just, because, it, that, and I, I think that's blue, that's what you're probably That's getting a major at, right? part of that increase is employees added to this district that were neglected for years and years and years. Yeah, well, I think in also operating the district effectively, like we were talking about improving the model system, too. It saves a lot of money, too. But, you know, and then I think we had a couple meetings, you know, I think that the Budget and Finance Committee should talk about some of these quick purchasings, like the pickups, like for you being required to get, take that up for bid. I mean, some of these things need to be ironed out so that it's more... Our procurement policy yeah, could be reviewed. I think ours, I, I think it's ours really, yeah, is yeah. one of the lowest I've seen yeah. out of all of the ones I've been looking yeah. at. The levels that we have to go and do everything at it essentially it, does hinder us to have to go out for it just, it's just Yeah, that when that. when you bought that I don't know, I think it was for three, example three buying trucks. the or something, whatever the the time. Right. Bringing it to the meeting and then da da da, da when it was just I didn't see yeah, I mean I don't know. I think there's <laughs> The, the, the other thing, though, is we can't do everything in-house. We don't have the equipment, and we don't have the staff. So it, it's to just say, oh, we could save a lot of money to do things in-house. We're not equipped to do things in-house, uh, and that is a problem. I, I, but I, I think we can get set up to do that. I mean, I think like that, just for example, that PRV, Lampico PRV email, I think we could set up a work crew to do that. And we have to have it. I mean, no, I, no, no, we don't have it now. And, and we but, have to have yeah. equipment. Yeah. Equipment. Sure. We're, we're moving in a direction of getting an engineering Design bill. Back. Design bill. You, you know, save all that money. There's if, more operators. Yeah. 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 We're trying to make up for a lot of neglect, and they're trying to. I mean, I think the most important thing to do, yeah, you, you want to know how we got where we are, but we need to look forward and make sure that we're, we're maximizing. And we we don't we, want to go one step forward and two steps back. I, we made we. There's a lot of it's just, you know hindsight's twenty twenty. We made a lot of mistakes in the past. Um, trying to be trying to be a good neighbor and bringing on, and I'm not faulting anybody, but we brought on, you know, we brought on Felton. This district was just, we were going to bring on Felton no matter what, and Felton came with a lot of problems. Felton came with a lot of problems. The only one that really came with money was Lumpico. Lumpico came with funds to, to do some repairs, but a lot of these small agencies we took over came with 
systems that needed to be fully replaced, and we took on that burden, and we probably shouldn't have done that. Was, and Felton was a big one. There was a lot to be done in Felton. Aren't you still, we still paying for Felton? 1,500 customers. Well, they are. They're, they're, they're paying for them to buy the system, but that didn't put any pipe in the ground. Yeah, we're out of compliance with that. You know, and and have debt still we on. have a lot of capital projects in Felton. We have a lot of capital projects all over, but we took on a considerable <laughs> amount of capital on all these different little consolidations we took. And we have quite a bit of our own. We've been impacted by a lot of disasters. We've got some of the money back, you know, to about a hundred percent. We still got, you know, one point five to two million dollar repair to the to an access road sitting out there from the last major storm that we're gonna have to you know, FEMA, they're fifty percent by the time you get all said and done. But there's a part and the neglect of the maintenance just compounded it because we didn't have money. And we lived off of reserves to prove to to other people that this district, you know, was less expensive than Cal Am. We lived off reserves for like four or five years. Just so we could keep our rates low. That was a mistake, hindsight. Big mistake. We should have, hey, if you want to come on, that's what it's gonna cost, and our rates are our rates. We didn't. And we should have put been raising our rates and putting that money into the into capital. And we took a, we took you know, a good four years and just did what we only had to do. And if we didn't have those disasters, well, I can't believe the shape that we'd be in if we didn't have the disasters that we brought in you know, several million dollars in repairs and replacement of, of tanks, pipes, pumps over the years, the earthquake especially. We got a lot of catching up to do. I see a light at the end of the tunnel, though. Like, I mean, this is where in the next five years, you know, some of our debts that are for the felt the Felton purchase or different watershed purchases will be getting paid off, and the debt that we're taking out is right. going to be for capital. You know, we have the large USDA loan coming up. There'll be other debts that we need to take on, and it's for capital, which is good. It's not for yeah. you know some other, you know, yeah. not unnecessary purchase. But I mean, it's it's spending the money where I think the district needs to be spending it right now. You're, you're going to see in James' report coming up our number of facilities. We have 50 He's tanks next. out there. 25, 28 pressure pump, pressure, pressure um, booster pump stations. You know, eight or nine wells, seven, we call it, six, seven surface sources. And you compare that to Scotts Valley and Santa Cruz, uh, they have nothing of the facilities that we have. They're so spread out. I mean, what you saw in Stephanie. That, that's Stephanie the ratio before. of customers to what yeah, it is. So that we have so many zones to take care of. Yeah. You know, so and 20... 33 30, pressure 30, zones? 30, 33 pressure zones. You know, in Santa Cruz, we have six. Um, we have an incredible amount of infrastructure out there. And a lot of it's reaching its life expectancy. Or it's undersized. <laughs> You know, and, and one of Bob's big um, projects that we we're talking about moving forward on is a is a realistic capital improvement program uh, that shows you know age of facilities, types of facilities, a, a, a great in depth that will show you costs and then free future costs. If you can't sell the community on an ambitious capital program right. without having that, I agree. It, it is essential. And totally we agree. Don't have it today. Totally agree. So. There's a, there's a lot of work to be done and a lot of expense. I mean, so then, it, it, just it, the it, maintenance it, neglect it, uh, itself is it, it's incredible. You, if you take a look at the age and, and project what the cost is going to be and what you need to put away so you can take care of that, it might be just staggering. Well, 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 absolutely staggering because um, what we did in Palm Pico is we looked, and of course we're just little, uh, but we looked at how old our tanks were, our pipes, our pressure reducing, all this kind of stuff. I worked with a CPA, we, we went through this, and we looked at what we needed to get, if, say we didn't merge, it, to fix all of our capital projects 
it would be staggering. We would have been tarred and feathered and run out of town if we tried to get that much money. As it was, we went for a huge rate increase, and I still hear about it every time I turn around. But hey, we had to do what we had to do, and I, I we need to have a realistic look at what we need in reserves. I agree, and an emergency reserve. And we need to stop discretionary spending. If we don't need to spend it, don't do it, is my feeling, because even though it's minuscule, it all adds up. Well, 10,000 there, 10,000 there, you got a pipe crew after a while. Right. Well, so, if we want, I'll just turn the direction. So this is my finance status report that was in the last board packet. Um, and it goes over some of the high-level stuff, uh, bill lists I removed from this presentation. Um, it'll tell you in the, the financial summary section what month it is or what it is that we're looking at. And so this was the Q2 um, and the December 2018 results. And it'll give a brief summary for, I mean, almost every single one is things are tracking as we expect. Um, if something is abnormal, we'll bring it up. If there's something significant that's going to be requiring a budget adjustment, we're going to have to come to the board for something like that. So a lot of the times it is, you know, there's nothing crazy going on. This is just some of the customer service stuff that we always put in there. Assumption by, by class. By the way, do you, in the customer service, do you use a CRM that you can break down the calls by type of call? Like, is it a billing yeah. call, service call, no CRM? No, no CRM. Right now, so. okay. The system pretty much is just registering um, the calls coming in to each extension going out and whatnot. Um, fiscal year end, so this is the this is the MDNA. So the first overview section just is kind of explaining what this document is in case it's someone's first time looking at it. It highlights the net operating results, the operating revenue, and the operating expenses. And then it'll go in and show what the non-operating revenue and expenses were, debt obligation payments. Oops, so on the property taxes, where's most of that money coming from, did you say? I think that was uh, property taxes. One, uh, Lompico, Felton. Lompico's is around 60, 70, and then the remaining portion is coming from um, any of the old school SLB customers. Gotcha. So Ben Loman, Boulder Creek. Felton did not come across. Felton did not come across. It had to be a special okay. district. Be a so they were Cal, uh, they were Cal Am. They no. were public. They were privately owned, so they did right. not, unfortunately, uh, come with any. Um, then it goes over the capital expenditures, and so again, this is where I think we can do a really good job. I mean, because essentially, I see what the spend is at the end, you know, at the end of it. So this is where a collaborative effort between um, engineering operations and finance would be able to put something together that's giving a little bit better, well-rounded, saying here's how much was spent on these projects and how those projects are doing. Um, is what I'm envisioning, you know, at some point in the future that we're able to elaborate on. Have these all been spent, or is this what is on this the is, So this is actually spent. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's the difference. Is when I'm getting involved, I'm reporting the, the results of stuff that's already been incurred. So this is the prior fiscal year balances, the Q1 and Q2 additions. So we spent about $1.1 1 .1 through the first six months of the year on capital projects. It looks like you just allocated some cost to Madrone, Caskey, and water treatment. No, it was, Lewis, it was an engineer <laughs> that did all yeah. the initial work, blanket divided. over, yeah, yeah, so right. it was divided amongst okay. each of them. Um, and this is where you'll get into, this is the individual month, <coughs> then the quarter and the year to date all look the same. It's comparing the actuals against the prior year and against the annual budget. Um, I always like to look at the prior year because that can help start to show you any potential trend, trends that may be, may be coming that you should be aware of. A lot of times, at least the last couple of years, it's always just been kind of a timing issue. Um, It'll break out some of the different 
items that, you know, what the, you know, salaries and benefits was 50K higher compared to prior year, uh, or 68K. 50 of that was timing of the prior, the, the prior year health bill. And then again, breaking it down in a little bit more visual. It's going over the quarterly. So again, this is the exact same look. You can kind of see it tends to be pretty consistent I don't mind to make it, need to make everyone go blind, but the three are essentially the same, but it's showing you the current month, the current quarter, and the year to date. Then it goes in and shows you the trend analysis, the example I gave about the revenue, you could see that in the July and August operating revenue. That's why you know July looks so low, is that was a journal entry required by the, you know, for, for the audit to be able to pull it in. I mean, in the wet year, we ought to be asking people to use as much in December as they did in, in September, right? Because we got plenty of water. It's not like they <laughs> It's not like we need to have a uh, stage it's two. Uh, no gardens to water that time of year, though, Bob. What? There's no gardens to water that time of year, though. But, that is true. But Take maybe an indoor showers. garden or two. <laughs> and I'll make this a, a little bit. Uh, let's go over there. Fill up the hot tub. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then it goes into the detailed expense by department. So this is where you can go in and see not just the large summary roll-up of all of the main expenses, what it's looking like by department. So general and administrative, you can see year-to-date, you know, it's, it's already at almost its full budget, but that's because it's a full year of insurance that already came. So that's very common. That account is tracking okay to budget as it is. Um, we had to get a new copier. That's going to end up causing this account to run run over. Obviously, uh, if we are already at 105% of the budget, it's already over budget. But again, you're not talking about large amounts of money. Anything that was of significance that doesn't seem to be tracking um, we would be coming back to the board to discuss. And for the most part, that's about it. And the other ones are just the cash balances and whatnot um, that are in all of the monthly reports. So the quarterly ones definitely do have more information um, helping to tie back to the budget and show how things are tracking. So right now, things are tracking great. Consumption is slightly ahead of what we were planning and expenses are running slightly below what was budgeted. So, I mean, you got the best of both worlds in, in regards to that. Um, some stuff is timing related, though, so you can't always, can't always, you always can't, 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 too. can't count your chickens yeah. <laughs> for, for, for well, all of the stuff. Just for a little nag for me, we have two jobs, and that one of the main jobs we have is a fiscal responsibility. And if you aren't getting these reports, if you don't understand them, if they aren't clear to you, board members, you need to ask for clarification. I'm sure Stephanie would love to have you come in and talk to her. I don't have any problem and, with that. And, and of course, our <laughs> other issue is policy, but. This is a very important one. We need to know what's going on. I think breaking the bill list out to be a separate document will make it a little bit easier to navigate the two because they are very different. Will it be a table? Hmm? Will it be a table? A table. As opposed to the current format. <clears throat> For the bill list? What do you mean? I mean, well, it spits out that way. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the accounting software I use, you can hang, you, you can spit out your bill list in a table. This one, it's got the accounts, and it's right. not, you can't, you can't do anyway, sorts, uh, you know, it's crystal, analysis. Yeah, it's, it's a crystal report. It I, is, I don't like crystal reports. Is, They're it not. Is, it is it's not a good report. Yeah, just for yeah. line items, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, it, it, from a board point of view, it's, not as helpful as if we had a different format, unfortunately. But we do need to be looking at it. We do. We need to look at it, and we need to ask the question. And the public, too. I mean, they can always ask questions and yes. get a better understanding, be more engaged. I mean, I've been doing a lot of budgets and audits, and um, there's crickets chirping typically in the room. So if people want to actually be involved and understand you know, some of this stuff, I'm all for it. I don't hear any crickets. 
not there's a good chunk of people here. If you go look at when I did the the last budget, I think we had like two people in the room. And the audit usually has hardly any. They trust us to take care of them. I mean, like it's it's not astounding stuff. It's not. I mean, it's important, but it's not the same way that people look at other businesses for when you're looking at different looking at their financials for stuff. I think to differ with you. It's I think important. It is. It's no, I think that's job. what I'm saying. I'm not saying it's not important. It's just not as exciting. Well, hey. Exciting. Most people won't even balance their own checkbook, so why would they think this is exciting? They just overdraft. But. Can you use a credit card? Okay. Do we have anything else to cover? No. No. Okay. I'll make a quick comment. Um, I have asked Stephanie a lot of the questions, and when she doesn't know, she looks it up and emails it to me. So kudos for Stephanie. You're, you're on top of stuff. And I, I do think. This has been talked about having a lot simpler reports made for general public consumption because this kind of stuff is really important for the board to get the whole the whole picture, but for a member of the public just to get an overview or for you to do a statement about here's where we are, like a couple paragraphs. These are the big expenses. These are ones we didn't expect. This is what we're going to have coming up. Why we need why we need to be looking at our budget, things like that. And I'm very interested in are departments being asked for their expertise in making their operations more efficient in each department? For ideas on maybe, you know, maybe crazy ideas to put out there brainstorming. Maybe we could do this instead and it might save us some money. I could tell you certain vendors see my name pop up on their phone and they know it's in their best interest to answer it <laughs> and at least deal with it now versus multiple phone calls. You're scary, huh? We're constantly going through bills and Reviewing expenditures and cutting stuff out that we don't need. Yeah, because you're the yeah. experts. You know it. And you know how you can do your job better. I'm not going to hear it. Yeah. Any other comments from the public? Then if no one minds, I, I have, would I leave. have one other, one other quick item. <laughs> All right. It's almost well, a 930 meeting. I, it, it's going to be real quick, and it's <laughs> not on the agenda, but I, uh, it's just a scheduling issue. Uh, the chair and I have been working on uh, trying to set up for the diversity training, um, and we have it scheduled We're tentatively. Trying to confirm. Yes. We're trying to confirm. Trying to confirm the 21st at 5:30 to 6:30. So it'd be conference. the regular night of our, our board meeting. There'll be no closed session, uh, and instead of having closed session, we'll have the training for one hour and then go into the meeting. Um, and this one, I make sure that everybody uh, can attend. I spoke with uh, <coughs> Director Smallman; he can attend. And so it's regular board meeting night, the 21st, to be the hour that we normally meet for closed session. Um, so hopefully all of you can attend. That's the thing I have. Okay, great. And then so, Saturday is the last of the Santa Margarita Gravel Art Agency's third of the series. Yeah. Third of the series. Yeah. We still have a good sense of Oh, I forgot. I, I want to I wanna end. We have to approve the minutes. And I need to pull the item for the 21st and abstain because I was not present. For the what? Okay. For you the, the meeting on the 21st? I, can, I can't vote on those minutes because I was absent. She was absent. We don't have that on here. Yeah, it's in the packet. 220. Oh, it's rare. Yeah, the, the, the consent February. agenda on the agenda isn't correct, but the packet is. 127. February 21st. February 21st. February 21st. The agenda says January 23rd. It should say the 21st as well. The packet has it, but the agenda doesn't. Oh. Minutes. February 21st. And she wasn't here. I think 11 a.m. Okay. would be her. It's 123. And I didn't get it on the agenda, but that, I added it to the packet. Right. That yeah, the backup's in there, but it's not on the front page of the agenda. That item will need to be placed on a future agenda. For yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's that won't that be. Okay. Okay. All right, then. Now you can address it. <laughs> that's why you didn't know about it. Yeah. All righty. Um, so are we done? Yeah.
Okay. Are you sure? Thank you, James. Okay. Wait, wait, can we no, wait, adjourn? Wait, do we accept the two that are on here, though? The consent agenda. I move approval of the two consent agenda items. Wait a second. Okay. What? Well, wait a second. I'm, I'm confused. I'm sorry. So the two agenda items on the consent agenda are 123 and 27. Correct. But 27 is not in here. It's 221. Oh, I see. Um, That's where I made a mistake. And, and so <laughs> it may be the 27 uh, content, but it's labeled 221. So okay. I suppose we could vote on the January 23rd, which is basically it was nothing. Yeah, okay. Right, or we could hold it over until the next. I think it'll hold it over. Let's hold, hold them over to the next. Yeah, let's just forget it. I'm confused now. Grab that article from the late fest. I have it. Okay, I I so we're agenting. We're agending this meeting. We're adjourning this meeting. Can you say the title? Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.